Dan Marino leads the way as the Miami Dolphins take the home field today to go against the Tennessee Oilers, both winners on opening day, looking to extend to a 2-0 start. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Don Cricky with Jim Mora. The word is spreading fast. This Tennessee team is a rising young ball club. Just ask the Oakland Raiders, who couldn't handle Eddie George last week. And I don't know if anybody can, Jim. He might be the best runner in the NFL right now. What I saw him do last week against the Raiders, I wouldn't trade him for anybody. He's got everything you want physically. He's big, he's strong, he's fast, he breaks tackles. He's just tough to get down. Plus, he's one of their, their team leaders. Well, the Raiders' number one game plan was to stop Eddie George. They couldn't even slow him down as he gained 216 yards on opening day and led the Oilers to that victory. Eddie George with phenomenal first week numbers, but the uh, Dolphins get a guy back today, Jim, and number 54, Zach Thomas, who could do some stopping. He's a great middle linebacker. Right. They need Zach Thomas back today if they're going to slow down Eddie George because he's the key to that run defense right there in the middle, and Eddie George likes to run up the middle most of the time. So they're going to, they're going to, they need him back. You know, he's going to help. The story continues to build here in South Florida about Dan Marino, the longtime quarterback of the Dolphins, who will start today, but there is speculation, Jim. That Jimmy Johnson like to get his own guy, Craig Erickson, in there. Well, I know Jimmy Johnson, and Jimmy Johnson will do whatever it takes to win a football game. And if he has to pull Marino and put in Craig Erickson, he'll do it, and he'll do it quick. But, uh, you know, Marino's got a lot of pride, too. Uh, he's a fierce competitor. His teammates will rally around him. I look for him to have a big game today. Well, he had a bad game last week against the Colts, and he rarely has two in a row, so he could be set for a big day. We'll be back with the Oilers and the Dolphins and the kickoff here from North Miami in a moment. And we're back to Pro Player Park with the Miami Dolphins dressed in their white home jerseys will receive to start the game as the Dolphins come into the game with a 16 to 10 win a week ago over the Indianapolis Colts but it was really the defense that carried the day. Al Del Greco, who kicked the game-winning field goal for the Tennessee Oilers last week in overtime, getting set now to kick the ball off. And here is Del Greco into the ball. He hits it downfield. And on the one hop, it is fielded, and that goes into the end zone. It will be a touchback there, and they'll go first and 10 from the 20-yard line, will the Miami Dolphins as the Tennessee Oilers now come out with their defensive unit, a very quick strike unit, a lot of speed and a lot of stunning. If you look at the people who will be protecting Dan Marino, he was not sacked last week by the Colts, as you know, Jim. Richmond Webb, probably the best of those offensive linemen, although Tim Ruddy is a rising star at center. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had a sprained ankle that he treated all week long with his own herbal wrap medicine, but whatever it was, it got him ready to go today, so... The Miami Dolphins are set to go first and 10 from their 20. Marino looking up top right away, and he throws down the field, and so vintage Dan Marino, an over-the-top throw, a tight spiral, gunned into O.J. McDuffie for an 11-yard gain and a Miami first down. Marino had problems with overthrows last week. As we look at the front four of the Tennessee Oilers, and the linebackers, a very solid group in Bowden, Wortham, and Lonnie Marks, who played at Tampa Bay last year. They mixed a lot of people into their secondary. They work with a lot of nickel and dime packages, five and six defensive backs, as the Dolphins now go from just across their 30. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar runs the ball and takes it to about the 33-yard line where middle linebacker Barry Wortham makes the stop for Tennessee. You know, Don, the Oilers uh, are tough to run against because they bring a safety up into the close to the line of scrimmage in that, in that box right there behind the tight end and the tackle. So what the Dolphins have got to do today to be successful offensively, they got to make plays in the passing game. They got to protect Marino, and they've got to throw the ball. They got to complete passes. They got to make plays. Marino has thrown once. It was good for 11 yards and a Dolphin first down. Opening drive. Dan Marino in his 15th year. No touchdown passes last week. One interception that was returned by a Colt linebacker for a touchdown. Marino under the rush. Gets it away beautifully. It's another first down as fullback Stanley Pritchett. Coming out of the backfield is led perfectly by Marino. 
And that is a 16-yard Dolphin play and a first down. Miami's offensive coordinator, Gary Stevens, said one of the things we have to do is not let people come free in the passing game or the running game. Number 58, Joe Bowden there came free, but, my, uh, but Marino was able to get the ball off the Pritchett, and they got a good game. They got a very good game, 16 yards, and so the Dolphins drive on. Ball now positioned at the Miami 49-yard line. Marino setting quickly again. Again, he fires and finds his man. Again, it's a Dolphin first down as O.J. McDuffie on a comeback pattern. He's ahead for a 12-yard gain before he's knocked down by Joe Bowden. Well, this is a replay. This is a, a O.J. McDuffie against Daryl Daryl Lewis here. Oh, it makes a nice out cut there and then comes back in, inside and uh, come back to the ball. You know, the important thing there for a wide receiver is that they come back to the ball on those kind of routes to, to, to make distance between him and the defender, and that's what he did on that play. So Dan Marino on target every throw so far. He's three for three for 39 yards as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar now runs the ball and gets a couple of yards on first down to just inside the 40. Marino, as you pointed out, Jim, after an extended visit with him yesterday, is not a happy guy over his coach, uh, saying, yes, he would pull him, and he thought about doing it last week. And then I think what exacerbated the whole story was the fact that Jimmy Johnson never went to Marino about it until Wednesday. Right. right. Simmer. He didn't. And, and you know, Dick, Marino was, uh, I talked to him on Friday, then I talked to him again yesterday, and he was not in a good mood. He definitely had his game face on for this game today against uh, Tennessee. And so far, he's been right on target with every throw has Dan Marino. Three throws, three completions, 39 yards as he's ready to put it up again. Marino down the field, wide open is McDuffie. And he's inside the 15-yard line. As Marcus Robertson knocks him down, and uh, Dan Marino looking as good as he ever has, and that's awful good. A 21-yard gain on that play, Jim. Oh, that was a great throw by Marino, and the, the thing here... They're blitzing right up the middle. You know, you have to get pressure on Marino up, up, up right in front of his face if you're going to cause him any problems. And they picked up the blitz, and he hit McDuffie. McDuffie was in motion, and he breaks open. All right, Tillmore Barnes, number 32, was covering him. He looked back at the ball, and Marino got the ball to McDuffie. But there is a Dolphin down at the uh, Tennessee 45-yard line. One of the Dolphins having a, looks like a leg looked at. It might be the fullback, Stanley Pritchett. So while Stanley's attended to, there's a break here at Miami. No score. Downs is there just taking the ball right down the field. Marino, four for four, throwing the ball, gives to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And there's not much there for him on a first down carry. Might have gotten a couple, but Stanley Pritchett, the best blocker in the Miami backfield, Jim Mora, came off, and he didn't look like he'll be ready to go back in soon. All right, that fullback position is a very important position for the Miami running game because he's the lead blocker on, on every running play. If you watch that fullback in the Miami offense, he's going to take you to the ball most of the time. Now, Dwayne Dotson's a pretty good blocker, but not quite as good as uh, Pritchett. Dwayne Dotson now in at fullback. This is the eighth play of the Dolphins' drive coming up, the opening drive of the game. Marino again, and again they give him time as he guns it over the middle, finds a man down to the eight-yard line, about four yards short of a first down. That will bring up third down. O.J. McDuffie again, Jim, on the crossing pattern, tackled by the middle linebacker for Tennessee, Baron Wortham. You know, so far in this drive, the uh, the Oilers have, have blitzed him a couple times, and both times that they blitzed him up the middle with their linebackers, Marino burned him. So that time they just played a, a, a regular four-man rush, a straight rush. They didn't blitz, and uh, Marino went to McDuffie. McDuffie's the go-to guy for these guys. He's, their, he's Marino's favorite receiver. He sure has been in this drive. O.J. McDuffie's been in motion a lot. Now he's positioned wide to the left. Just out of your picture as Marino drops, looks at McDuffie, throws, and it's almost intercepted. It was a gift wrap throw right to Darrell Lewis, but he couldn't hold on, so Marino's first incompletion is very nearly an interception that would have been run back a long way. Marino throws this route as good as any quarterback in football. It's a little slant route. Oh, man. He's just, he's just a little bit ahead of uh, McDuffie there. Darrell Lewis should have had the interception. He gets the interception there, and there's no points for the Dolphins. Right here now, they got a chance for a, a pretty good chip shot field goal. And their new place kicker, Olindo Mave from Syracuse, who grew up here in South Florida, ready to kick for Jimmy Johnson's team. 
This is a treacherous part of the field to kick on the infield because the Marlins are still in season, the baseball Marlins. But no problem. Namare now is wide, so on a very impressive opening drive is all for naught as the Dolphins come up with no points to the dismay of Jimmy Johnson as the NFL and NBC continue. An extended opening drive led by the passing of Dan Marino gets the Dolphins in position for a 26-yard field goal, but the rookie Mare is wide, and Dan Marino a moment ago after his first incompletion was almost a completion to cornerback Darrell Lewis of Tennessee. But Lewis dropped the ball. Now with McNair at quarterback, the Oilers go on offense in this scoreless game. Pitch back, and there goes Eddie George. The Dolphins come calling, and good defense by Miami as the penalty marker is fired in. As we look now at the Miami, uh, the Tennessee Oilers offensive line, very good up front blocking. They like to go left a lot because Hopkins, Matthews, and Stepnowski are so good. Donnelly and Runyon, two other good players. It's a real strength of this team. Eddie George, the runner, he'll get it a lot. Got it 35 times against the Raiders. Why check? They'll be throwing to the H-back. Sanders the best deep threat, although Willie Davis is also very fast. Playing on this infield portion of the stadium here, though, Jim Morris, that is difficult. All the Dolphins, particularly Jimmy Johnson, said he wants to see the Oilers offense down in that infield mud as much as possible. All right, Jimmy said that, uh, that the footing is just different down there. You slip, you can't get a lot of good traction, you know, whether you're a running back or a blocker or whatever. So, uh... He likes to play. He likes to get that. That he likes to get that Oilers offense on the on that dirt. You know, this is an advantage right now for that Miami defense. And he's got him on that dirt right now. As on the penalty call, it'll make it first down and 20 for Tennessee. McNair, to Eddie George, George breaking tackles and he gets out to about the 15-yard line. So the Dolphins continue to do a good job. Gang tackling Eddie George. George Hill, the Dolphins defensive coordinator, said you got to grab and hold on and wait for help. As you look at the front four, Jason Taylor of the Dolphins, a rookie third-round pick from Akron. 6'6", 245 pounds, but a very quick and good pass rusher. Zach Thomas back at middle linebacker. A big assist. He was out barely a month with a leg fracture. Then only plays well, he heals fast. Second down, and about 15. McNair with a good play fake, takes a look. Now McNair is on the run. He's got room to go as McNair, moving upfield, ducks out of bounds smartly just before Zach Thomas can level him. So McNair, who rushed for 33 touchdowns as a collegiate at Alcorn State, gets a 10-yard gain on that play. One of the things that uh, that, that uh, the orders like to do is they like to get McNair outside the pocket with bootlegs and dash plays and sprint outs, and they start the bootleg here to the right, to his right, but he has to scramble because the Dolphins have good coverage, but he picks up the yardage running pretty good yardage because of the kind of athlete he is. He's an excellent runner. He really is. He doesn't like to run, though. The scouting report on him is when he runs, he's usually looking to throw. That time, nothing was open, so he took it for 10 yards. McNair stands in, he needs four, and he throws the ball in way low, almost motion in the offensive line of the Oilers. So the Oilers struggle on their first possession, and they'll have to punt the ball. He was looking at Willie Davis, but no one could have caught that ball. It came in on the one hop. That was not a good throw by McNair. There's no question about it. And he had pretty good protection right there. He had time to throw and pick out his receiver, but he made a poor throw. The thing that's impressed me so far about this Miami defense, Don, is how quick they are. They're extremely quick. Yeah, they've, uh, Johnson said, we are undersized as a defense, but our strong suit is we are quick and they all can run. Here's a punt hit downfield by the former Dolphin, Reggie Roby. And it's a good return as Jordan brings it back across midfield and down to the 43-yard line of Tennessee. Charles Jordan runs it back, and so Marino and the Dolphins will have good field position when we come back. With Jim Mora, this is Don Crickey back at Miami with the Dolphins' second possession. Starts in good field position as we see what Marino had to say with, to Johnson, Jim. Yeah, he said, uh, you know, he said, it's your team, you're the head coach, but uh, I don't like being put on the bench because I'm a competitor and I want to play and I can help this team win. Has not been put on the bench yet and certainly not off that opening drive where he hit his first five passes. 
This time, the Dolphins run the ball, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar takes it inside the 40. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you expect some guy, Jim, 7-4 with a sky hook, but he's about 5'11", 200 pounds. The runner from UCLA, who was a third-round pick last year and had a terrific season, 1,100 yards. He had a great year for a rookie, and uh, he's not a big guy, but he's a slasher. He's strong. He's a slasher. He likes to run right up field. Not real fast, but uh, he does have the ability to power. He now turns it outside, and the Oilers come and get him on the second down and sixth play. Knock him down about a yard short of the first down. Darrell Lewis was the lead tackler, along with number 56, Lonnie Martz. There is Blaine Bishop, perhaps the best strong safety in the NFL, a first-team All-Pro player for the Oilers, who held out all summer, got the big contract, and then unfortunately fractured his forearm, making a tackle last week against the Raiders. But he expects to be back after the bye week. The Oilers are off next week, and he hopes to be back for the next game after that against Baltimore. Here's the handoff, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, working hard, didn't get there. On third and less than two, James Roberson. A big defensive end from Florida yeah, they're State. Gonna, they're going to go for it. I believe they're going to go for it. I think it's a good decision right here. They're too close to punt. It's a little too far for a field goal. They'd have to kick off the dirt. They've tried that once, and the field goal was no good right. by Mare. A little tougher to kick off that dirt. Mare told us that yesterday. They don't have far to go here. they got about a yard or less, so this is a good decision. Well, we'll find out, as uh, Marino hasn't thrown yet in this drive. Fourth down in a yard. Will he put his own head down? Now he's going to make sure they get the right play call. Saw the Tennessee defense and called a timeout. So as the when the NFL on NBC continues, Marino and the Dolphins will be going for it on fourth. Back in sunny South Florida, although Tropical Storm Erica has been building speed 500 miles off the coast, and there is some threat of rain today. As Jeff Fisher, a defensive specialist, looks at his D unit out there now looking to stop the Dolphins. Miami on fourth down and a yard in the scoreless first quarter. Now Marino comes back from the timeout with an eye set, a big pullback in the block. And the Oilers make the knockdown. It looks like they have, they have indeed stopped Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So the first boos of the day start to roll on down here at the Miami Dolphins home of ballpark as uh, Jimmy Johnson's team is stopped on fourth down. Oh, yeah, you know, as a coach, when it's fourth and a yard or less, you've got to believe offensively you've got to make that. You've definitely got the advantage. And what you try to do defensively there, defensively there is get penetration. You've got to get your defensive linemen and linebackers upfield. You can't let them have a yard. Yeah, and I, I think probably that uh, Stanley Pritchard not being in there. He's, a, he's an excellent lead blocker for him at that fullback position, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, that hurt him a little bit there. The early report on Pritchard is that he uh, sustained some ligament damage to one knee. He'll receive an MRI tomorrow, but he will not play again today. Miami's best blocking bat. Now McNair and the Tennessee Oilers try a second time. A quick out to Chris Sanders. He can fly, and Sanders sprinting straight ahead for a gain of about nine yards, taken down by the free safety of the Dolphins' Corey Harris. Along with Derek Rogers, a rookie outside linebacker who's been a terrific first-year player. It's interesting, Jim, the philosophy that Jimmy Johnson has about rookies. He says he likes to play them. He said they're, they're ready, they're going to get in there. This is a quick screen to the wide receiver, and what, what happens here is number 72, Brad Hopkins, right there on your screen. He pulls and gets out in front of the receiver and, and tries to block those cornerbacks. Brad Hopkins, the big left tackle, out in front of the play, and so it's second down and two now as McNair looking to throw. He's on the run, McNair turning up field, and Steve McNair gets the first down and then gets out of bounds. McNair is big at 6'2", 230 pounds, and this guy is really starting to blossom. Boy, his teammates love to play for him, and he really knows the system in addition to all the physical attributes. The Oilers have a, a rookie right defensive end, Jason Taylor. You can see him there. He's uh, rushing against Brad Hopkins. He's undersized. Brad Hopkins is 300 pounds. What Jason Taylor can't do is try to rush over Brad Hopkins. He's got to go around him and try to beat him with his quickness. That time he tried to rush over him. Yeah, he's a speed rusher, Jason Taylor, at 6'6", 245. About 30 pounds less than they'd like him, but now the running play goes, and it's Rodney Thomas 
On a cutback run, and he takes it across midfield on first down and gets to the 48-yard line. So for the first time in the game, the Oilers start to generate some offense with 3.40 to play in the first quarter and no score. Sean Wooden made the tackle. He had a terrific game last week for the Dolphins. Sean Wooden, number 22 from Notre Dame with two interceptions and a fumble recovery. He was the AFC Defensive Player of the Week. Six-round draft choice. On second and six, Wycheck goes in motion. Hand off Sanders and an end around, and the Dolphins are there to smother it. As Jason Taylor, you talked about his speed, Jim, and never more was it in evidence. Here's Jason Taylor right here, playing right defensive end. Jason Taylor is not the kind of guy that you want to run reverses on because he's the kind of guy that's got the kind of speed that he can he can run that thing down if he's fooled a little bit. And he saw that offensive lineman pull out in front of him and that said, hey, something's coming back to me. He reacted and made a heck of a play. Terrific play, running it down now on third down and 14. Watch for Ronnie Harmon, number 33. In the backfield as McNair takes a look. Stands in. McNair is on the run. And there he goes as McNair moves up. He's not going to get there. He got back to the 47-yard line and every... Dolphin that could took a clean shot at him, led by Trace Armstrong and the rookie Derek Rogers. So that brings up fourth down, and Reggie Roby comes out to punt for Tennessee. They had a corner blitz then. Denard Walker, number 25, was blitzing from the left side from uh, the Oilers' right side. But you know, already in the game, Don McNair's had to run, I think, three, three times he scrambled. So what you're seeing here is real good coverage by the Miami secondary and linebackers they're a very sound team they're simple they don't give you a lot of different looks but what they do they do well and they have been, they have indeed been doing it well yeah that's right he's had no room to go on those three times he's run he's had a run all were pass plays and here is Roby hitting a very high good punt downfield that uh, Jordan will fair catch at the 12 yard line so it'll be first down and 10 for a third possession for the Dolphins after a 35 yard punt by Roby the NFL season extends to the World Wide Web on NFL.com, the league's official website. Visit NFL.com for all the scores and stats, including a complete roundup of this weekend's scores in action. Plus, chat with some of the NFL's biggest stars. It's all at NFL.com. And right now, let's see if Marino, who could not capitalize on good field position the last possession, and start driving the Dolphins again as he did in that opening drive when he hit his first five passes. No score in the first quarter. To the run, and on his home field, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar trying to cut wide, loses his footing. James Roberson was on him quickly. We talked about Miami's defense being fast and quick and aggressive and swarming to the football. The Oiler defense is very similar. Now, they're a little bit more complicated they give you more looks in the coverage and up front defensively they blitz more things like that they're not quite as vanilla or simple as, as Miami's defense but they're just as quick just as fast there's a picture of Greg Williams he's the defensive coordinator for the Oilers very fine young football coach on second down and 12 Marino cocks his arm throws the out beautifully Dan Marino fires for a first down let's find out what's going on with the Red Hot Patriots as we go to Greg Gumbel in New York Greg all right, Don, the Patriots are red hot, and so is Drew Bledsoe. He doesn't have Terry Glenn available today, so he looks for and finds Sean Jefferson. This is a 34-yard scoring strike, Bledsoe's fifth touchdown of the season. With the extra point, the Patriots lead the Colts 7-0, Don. Thank you, Greg. So the Patriots off to a fast start, and most impressive off their opening win, they graded out number one in the NFL on defense last week. And that route of San Diego, here's a handoff. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar running hard on first down, and he's hit, seemingly stopped, and then he gets a few more as he is finally taken down by defensive end Anthony Cook. But there's a gain of almost eight on the play. Well, this is a good play. Jimmy Johnson would really like to run the football. He told us yesterday, he says, I don't think we're going to be able to run against these guys because they play so much eight-man front. Eight-man front means they take one of their safeties who normally play deep, they bring them up close. And that will do it for a very quick first quarter. No score. As the NFL and NBC continues, it'll be Miami coming back to start the second quarter. We start the second quarter and we take a look at Jim Mora's matchups. 
Well, that first one, Grant Hopkins against Taylor is a big, strong tackle against a young, undersized defensive end. And uh, right now, I think Hopkins has the advantage. The second one, Stepnowski against Thomas. In order for the Oilers to run the football, Stepnowski's got to do a better, uh, do a good job on Thomas. The last one, the, the uh, Dolphins got to make plays in the passing game. So Marino's got to do a good job against that secondary. Marino, six for seven, throwing so far. Five of the receptions to McDuffie for 67 yards. Here's a handoff, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, both hands on the ball, powers his way on second and two, ahead for a gain of eight yards and a first down. Irving Spikes is in, and there's a blocker on the play. We, we saw Marino yesterday in, in the walkthrough, and he was limping just a little bit. He's had some troubles with his legs. He's had a broken ankle. He's had a torn Achilles tendon, and he wears a special shoe, as you can see right there, to protect that leg. Dan Marino, what a career he's had, though, and... 369 touchdown passes for a career, his career. No one is close to that in the history of the game. The sixth quarterback selected when he came out of the University of Pittsburgh back in 1983. Picked ahead in that year were John Elway, Jim Kelly, Todd Blackledge, Ken O'Brien, and Tony Eason. Only Elway and Marino remain from that class of 83. Now there's a break in the action early in the second quarter and still no score. Miller Light, now official beer sponsor of the NFL. By Buick LeSaver for safety and peace of mind. By American Express, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, American Express helps you do more. And by Coca-Cola Classic, always the real thing, always Coca-Cola. All-Pro safety Blaine Bishop can't play for the Oilers because of a broken arm, but he can still help, Jim. Right, he's over there. There's Blaine Bishop right there. And there's Renee Stewart right there. When Renee came out of the game, Blaine's over there coaching him up. He's working on that next career. <laughs> Renee Stewart taken up on the last play, but appears to be okay. He comes off the field for at least one down. First down now for Marino and the Dolphins. No score, second quarter. Marino stands in again, throws it beautifully up the middle. And on the run is Irving Spikes, and he's not done until he's down to the 38-yard line. The biggest gainer of the day is Marino standing in against the rush. Finds the open man, and a 24-yard gain is the result. Here's Irving Spikes right there. A little play action fake, not much, as he's going to help block right there. See him help block? Now he's going to... There he is right there. Releases that inside, and Marino hits him. But uh, he kind of sits up there and blocks first, and then if there's nobody coming, no linebacker blitzing, he's going to release, and he's usually a secondary... You know, not the primary receiver, but a secondary receiver. And Jim Marino had only 105 yards passing the entire game last week against the Colts. He already has 108 early here in the second quarter today. Looking again, out pattern, another strike by Marino. He must have had some nice week of practice because you play like you practice, and he's playing great. Uh, he's playing great. He looks like the Marino that everybody knows, and, and, and the guy that uh, for the last 14-plus years has been you know, striking fear into the hearts of uh, defensive coordinators. You watch this guy in film getting ready for a game, and it just, it just worries you to death. You worry all week, and that's how he's playing right now. He's tearing up the uh, Oilers secondary. He's only missed one throw so far today, Dan Marino. Now the Dolphins and the Oilers, both without points. Nothing, nothing. Early in the second quarter. Handoff, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar finds a gap on second down and three, and he runs straight ahead for a Miami first down. Joe Bowden knocked him down. So good diversity in the Dolphin offense. They're giving a lot of carries to Kareem also. Yeah, you know, the, the Dolphin running game is very simple. They just do a lot of man-for-man -man blocking. The offensive lineman gets their hat on the guy across from him. Nothing complicated. And that running back just from a deep alignment just gets the ball and finds an open spot. And that's what they did there. All it simple took. running game. Little gap opened up, and right through it went Kareem. Dolphin offense has had the ball most of this game. We've seen very little of the Oiler offense, and Eddie George has just hit him on the field. Here's Marino throwing to the end zone. He overshoots O.J. McDuffie. A diving try. Steve Jackson was a step behind trying to cover. Now the Dolphins look to go long on first down and almost connect. Well, McDuffie's been the, the main guy for uh, Marino here so far in the game, and he's trying to beat him, get him here long into the end zone. Just a little bit too long with the throw. Now Charles Jordan comes in the game. It brings up second down and 10. And McDuffie definitely had a step on him. He had him beat. 
I think Dan could have kind of arched that thing a little bit more. He put a lot of zip on it. And the Oilers looking to take some of the zip away of extra defensive backs in the game. Now a good hit as Tamur Barnes, number 32, comes up and puts a shoulder on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And the knockdown's made at the 24-yard line. So it can be a little expensive, Jim, when you miss a first down throw. Now they've got third down coming up after the short run. Yeah, I, th I think that the key here from that I think so far is that it's the Dolphins have been able to run the football. You know, Jimmy didn't Jimmy Johnson didn't think they could run the football as well as they're doing. If they can keep the, the Oilers defense off balance with a balanced attack, run and pass, they're gonna have a tremendous advantage offensively. Jimmy Johnson so far has seen his team run the ball 12 times for 29 yards, all 12 carries by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The rest has been Marino passing. He's over 100 yards, standing in. Marino swings it out beautifully. Gets the ball to Bernie Connolly. He's inside the 15-yard line, and on third down, he has a first down. So Marino has been magnificent. He's made two errant throws, one just overshooting McDuffie, but the rest have been on target. There's Parmalee right there, and he's going to release late out of the backfield. Now, Marino's looking downfield, but there's, there's nobody open, so, you know, He's that kind of quarterback. He's going to find that secondary receiver, and he hits Parmalee for a big game. And this uh, Oiler defense, Jim, is spending an awful lot of time on the field. It's been Miami's day on offense all game long. Oilers have had about six offensive plays, and that's it. We're into the second quarter. Marino hands off. Kareem cuts back, and he's down close to the seven-yard line. Taken down on the play by the middle of the Oiler defense, led by Baron Wortham. One of the best things that uh, Jabbar does, and you mentioned, uh, Don, that he's not real fast. There he is right there, is he's able to find a hole and, 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 and react to it. He's got really good instincts as a runner. He's got great cutback ability, as he showed right there. Cutting back to get them in position now with a second down and six play. Second and six for a first down, second and seven for a touchdown in this scoreless game. Marino hands off. Kareem has stopped as the... Tennessee Oilers were looking to hunt the ball there. Anthony Cook, who made the hit on the play, was really working on the football also. As we have new backs coming in and out from Miami, now Bernie Parmalee comes in on a third down play. He and can't get to Marino still. Even though he's had all the leg injuries, Jim, he still gets the ball away before anybody can hit him. That, that's the thing about Marino that, that, that sets him apart. I mean, a lot of things make him a great quarterback, but he has the quickest release in football. And he's going to get rid of that ball before you can sack him. That's why he doesn't get sacked much. Very hard to get to. Now Marino goes to the shotgun on third down. Fired up as he is. If it's open, he might run it right up the middle if he has to. He's closed, and he put too much on it. And Marino coming now to talk to somebody. I don't know if the official, he's protesting that he thought his guy was interfered with. Charles Jordan, ball was thrown too hard. Ball was thrown a little bit hard. The Oilers are, are only rushing three players right there. So they're going to be defending with eight back there, and that's a little bit difficult to find somebody open, especially down there close to the goal line. They're going to spread all eight of those defenders across that end zone area. It's tough to find a guy open inside. Alinda well, Mare, who missed from 26 yards at the infield end of the stadium, now will try a 24-yarder, which he hits. It is on the way, and the first points of the day are on the board as the Dolphins have taken the lead 3 to nothing. Alinda well, Mare from Syracuse, a free agent kicker who had a big day last week hitting all three field goal tries against the Colts and then punting when John Kidd was injured. Three times for a 47-yard average. Mare just getting the first points of this day on a 24-yard field goal. And here comes Mel Gray for Tennessee. Good special teams coverage by the Dolphins on a 20-yard return. As the NFL and NBC continues, the Oilers have the ball. There is Doug Blevins, the kicking coach for the Miami Dolphins. He's a wonderful story, Jim, and a very good coach. Oh, he's a great coach. You know, last year the Dolphins were last in the league in field goal percentage, so Jimmy Johnson felt like he needed a kicking coach, and he hired Doug Blevins. He's been a real inspiration to them. Physically challenged. He's in a wheelchair, but he knows football and how to coach it, and he's helped the Dolphins a lot. Now they go to Eddie George to the Tennessee Oilers, and the Dolphins giving up yards very grudgingly to the big back who rushed for 216 yards in week one against the Raiders. Jim Bowens made the stop as 
Look at the time of possession and the total yards so far in this game. The Oilers offense hasn't been here. That's why they haven't done much. They haven't had the ball. 34 yards. Wow. McNair, one of two throwing for just eight yards. Again, they power run the ball. On a third down and seven play, Eddie George gets ahead for about four or five yards. Taken down on the play by Tim Bowens, and also on the stop was Baron Tanner. What Miami felt like they had to do defensively, they, they didn't put anything special in to stop George. They just emphasized their football players. Fellas, we got to tackle, and we got to get a lot of guys to the ball. We got to gang tackle George. That's what they're doing. Big third down as the Oilers looking for a first down. Hand off Eddie George, and he doesn't get a thing. They thought they could slow him down. Zach Thomas said during the week, we stopped Eddie George last year, and we think we can do it again. The Dolphins beat the Oilers last year, and Eddie George was held to 60 yards, 24 of them coming on one draw run play. Personal foul. Face mask. Number 54 defense. Whoops. 15 yards penalty for the run. Zach Thomas who did some grabbing, Jim. Bill Carollo, our referee. Well, Zach Thomas is an excellent run defender. There he is right there, and he's going to flow right to the football. Boy, perfect right there. Nobody blocks him. He makes a good high tackle. And what happens a lot of times right there, he had to grab the face mask. He didn't mean to do that. He's just making the tackle. His hand gets up there, gets a hold of that face mask, and they're going to call it every time. That was a heck of a play by Thomas. Only problem was that nobody blocked him. But on the uh, and he's got a, one of the best centers of that's been to the Pro Bowl five straight years. Stepnowski trying to block him, but he plays so far off the line. Look at how far back Thomas is. Center can't get to him. McNair on first down swings it out beautifully, and here is Rodney Thomas putting on some moves and then spinning ahead as he gets to the 49-yard line. And we go back to Greg in New York to check out the Jets. Don, a while ago, we told you about Drew Bledsoe's fifth TD pass of the year. This is Neil O'Donnell's sixth. 19 yards to the rookie. Diedrich Ward makes it a 10-0 Jets lead over the Bills. Second quarter. Don? Thanks, Greg. Can you believe the Jets number one in offense? That's amazing. You know, O'Donnell's having a great, uh, so far, he's had two good games, or he's having a second good game, but uh, those two quarterbacks are really hot. Here's Eddie George. They need four, and George is stopped again. That time, it was Baron Tanner, a defensive lineman, number 72 from Oklahoma, who beat the block and got Big Eddie. Well, you know, Baron, Baron Tanner, there he is right there, playing defensive right tackle. He is another one of Jimmy Johnson's rookies playing on defense. He's got two rookie starters, uh, Derek Rogers and Jason Taylor, but uh, Tanner comes in the game, plays a lot. He's also a rookie. Fifth-round draft pick from Oklahoma. Jimmy likes those rookies. He likes those young guys. Pressure now is on McNair. Third down and five. Dolphins bring up people on the outside. Are they going to blitz? They come with a four-man rush. McNair sent what a throw by McNair. And running now in the open field is Ronnie Harmon. And the veteran from Iowa is all the way down to the 25-yard line. A 27-yard play and a brilliant look and throw and then catch. Well, this play starts with protection, and you can see right here the offensive line right there makes a nice pocket for McNair. He's got a good open space right there to throw to. They like to flank Ronnie Harmon out so he can get off that line of scrimmage, and they did a good job there. Ronnie Harmon, yep, on the 27-yard catch and run, and the Oilers have their best penetration. Now they go right up the middle, and Eddie George, who calls himself a straight-line runner who likes to go between the tackles, takes it right at the Miami Dolphin defense. Last week, Jim, we saw Eddie get a lot of yards, starting up straight ahead, then bouncing to the outside, but the Dolphins have shut that down. They've run him down. Yes, they have. You know, and I'm sure they saw that, uh, what happened last week against the Raiders, and they worked on it this week in practice, and they are so quick and fast that they're able to react to that and shut that stuff down. But right there, it looked like that uh, Oiler line was uh, blowing that uh, Miami defensive line off the ball a little bit. No question. Out of the block to Oilers won that last blast off, knocking Miami's undersized defensive front, except for the two tackles back. Quick out. Ball is to Sanders, and he finds a blocker, and somehow Chris Sanders works his way down close to the 15-yard line, where Corey Harris, the free safety, knocked him out of bounds for Miami. 
That's that same play they ran earlier in the game, that quick screen to the wide receiver. And what you'll see here is the offensive left tackle. He's going to pull out here in front of number 81 Sanders and try to block on the cornerback, but the corner black back reacted quicker than Hopkins could get out there. And now a, a very big third down rises for the Tennessee Oilers. The ball position at the 16-yard line of Miami. Dolphins lead 3-0 in the second quarter. Calling uh, his own number, Steve McNair at 230 pounds gets all he needed and a couple of yards more. Behind is all-pro guard Bruce Matthews, first down Tennessee. Well, here's McNair. He's going he's gonna to do the quarterback sneak on, on short yardage. He's going to run right over number 74, Bruce Matthews, right there. They double-team the tackle, that rookie tackle, uh, Tanner, and he makes, picks up the first down. The Tennessee Oilers with their first threat of the game, trailing 3-0 in the second quarter. McNair to Eddie George, cutting back, and there's Eddie George, and he's heading in, and the Oilers take the lead. As Eddie George finally cracks and solves this Miami defense, the blocking unlocked it, and he goes 13 yards for a touchdown. Well, that looked like the Eddie George that uh, we saw last week against the Raiders. There he is right there. Now, this play is really designed to go outside, but they've got to contain, so he cuts it back inside. Now, Corey Harris there had a chance to make the tackle, but he didn't do it. He missed the tackle. you got to tackle him high. Corey went too low. Harris went too low. The Raiders seem to even be bouncing off him low off his thighs last week. Yeah, he's got he such power, and he's had a very big stride, Eddie George. A nine-play, 79-yard drive. Eddie George on the final 13 for the touchdown, and now... The automatic L, Del Greco, boots the extra point, and the Oilers have taken a 7-3 lead, and they'll kick off as the NFL and Eddie George just headed into the end zone from 13 yards out for the go-ahead touchdown for Tennessee. And finally, unlocks the defense as the big offensive front of the Oilers starting to move the Dolphins off the ball. Now Del Greco, who hit the extra point, kicks off it downfield and this is Irving Spikes good special teams hit made back at the 20 yard line and here comes a penalty marker in a 16 yard return on the play number 51 Lemansky Hall was down there first and a holding call is signaled against the Dolphins. Let's watch the touchdown again, Jim Mora. Well, the offensive line for the Oilers do a good job here. That's the strength of their offense, but you'll watch the right guard there, number 77, Kevin Donnelly. He's going to pull around, and he's going to block the contain man, the, either the linebacker or the safety. And George is going to start out. He's going to come in here, start outside, then break it back up inside the contain right there. And Corey Harris had a shot at him there, the safety right there. He had a shot at him, but he went too low and left his feet. You gotta drive through people when you tackle them. You can't dive at them and leave your feet. And it's good running though by George. That was the Raider problem last week as they kept bouncing off Eddie George. They didn't wrap him. Now after the blocking foul called against the Dolphins on the return, Marino has the long field to go. Starting first down just outside his 10. Marino gets time, he dumps it over the middle again. And then the Oiler tacklers close in on Irving Spikes and knock him down hard. Aaron Wortham and Joe Bowden, two of the linebackers, were on the stop. Well, Marino's doing a good job here of going to his secondary receivers. Obviously, the Oilers are doing a, a good job in coverage back there on the primary guys, but he's hitting those backs coming back out, coming out of the backfield. He looks at everybody. He's got after, you know, now in his 15th year, there's nothing he hasn't seen, and nobody makes the reads. I mean, he looks at every receiver. Uh, he's, he's seen everything that you can possibly see from a defense, and he knows how to adjust to it and what to do. Now he's changing the blocking here because he sees the Oilers shift in what could be a blitz by the Tennessee defense. Reno getting the throw again. They give him time. He runs out of it, and he did well to get the ball before he was knocked down. As he was looking at his fullback, Dwayne Dotson, but Josh Evans, a very good young player, number 91 for Tennessee, was the man who got to Marino and forced the errant throw. What, what the Oilers felt like they needed to do was get a push out of these inside guys. Get in Marino's face. And that's exactly what they do there with number 91, Josh Evans. He got good pressure, good push on Marino right there and affected his throw. Two minutes and 32 seconds to play in the first half. Don Cricky with Jim Mora. 
as the Miami Dolphins on their home field go to the shotgun on third down and six. Marino airs it out long. He's got a man. And then good coverage on the play as the defender, Denard Walker, did the right thing and looked back. He looked like he was shielding the intended receiver, Fred Barnett. But he looked back, so there's no flag. Yeah, Barnett's got, Barnett has got Denard Walker beat right there. He's got him beat. He's running by him. But the ball was thrown short. Now, if Marino would have laid it out there for him, it could have been a touchdown. A long ball try on third down by Marino and the Dolphins. And now we have the first punt of the game for Kyle Richardson, the new punter for Miami. John Kidd was hurt last week. Richardson was looking for a job up in Vero Beach as of last week. And here's Mel Gray running it back. Mel Gray protecting the ball gets it to the 49-yard line. Let's check out the Ravens and the Bengals as we go back to Greg in New York. All right, Don, in Baltimore, Jeff Blake and the Bengals get on the board first in this game in the second quarter. From eight yards out, Blake finds Carl Pickens cutting across the back of the end zone with the extra point. Cincinnati leads the Ravens 7-0, just under five and a half to play in the first half. Don? Thank you, Greg. Bengals, boy, they had a thrilling victory, needing three touchdowns in the fourth quarter last week, Jim. Right. Came back and got it, and uh, they're off to a good start today. Bruce Cosmo's Kos done a good job with that football team. Yeah, he was 7-2 uh, and two after taking over last year for David Shula. Now on first down and 10, the Oilers leading 7-3. Give the ball to Eddie George and the big guy from Ohio State. The Heisman Trophy winner in 95. Runs ahead for a gain of 7 yards before strong safety Sean Wooden got him down. Well, we're now down to the two-minute warning. The game moving quickly, and the Oilers' offense has been picking up speed. 7-3 to three, Tennessee here in the second quarter. Don Crickey with Jim Mora. The Dolphins were dominating the game on offense but could only get three points, and now Jim Momentum seems to have shifted. It looks to me like the, uh, the, the Oilers' offensive line is starting to take over against that Miami defense. Now on second down and three. The handoff goes, and Eddie George works his way ahead, and he has a first down. As time becoming a factor, the clock running down to 150 to play in the first half. The Miami youth movement had a lot of young players. Last year, there was interesting. We met with Jimmy Johnson yesterday. Jimmy was saying at one point last season, he started eight rookies right, eight in the game. Yeah, eight rookies made their team last year, and all eight of them were starting at the end of the season. Eight more rookies made the team this year. They've got 16 players on their football team, one-third of their football team, who were rookies this year or rookies last year. His philosophy is if a guy is ready, we'll put him right in there. We're not going to worry about a learning curve. The guy has more ability, we want him in there. And here's a guy with ability, Eddie George, running through the Dolphins. So they stop excellent Eddie early, but all of a sudden, the big back starts pounding away, and the Dolphins... One, one of the uh, the players that the Oilers really like is John Runyon, their right tackle, right there. He doesn't get quite the notoriety that Matthews and Donnelly and Hopkins and some of those guys get, but he does an excellent job. And, of course, Eddie George, you know, like, uh, like he can do, he powers up in there with those high knees and that good long stride. He really has a huge stride. Very hard to wrap those legs of Eddie George at 242 pounds. Back to Eddie George, and now he takes it at the middle of the Miami defense and comes inside the 25-yard line and finally works himself all the way down to the 19. They had him in Austin. Jason Taylor was holding on, but Jimmy Johnson now seeing his defense, quick as it is, getting overpowered. Well, you've got to have some size, too, on defense. Now, they've got a per couple of pretty good-sized defensive tackles in Gardner and Ballins, but uh, other than them, they're not a very big defense. And that Houston Oiler offense, or that Tennessee Oiler offensive line is a big, strong, good-blocking offensive line. And right now, they're winning the battle up front. I and know, they, Jim, when you looked at films of last week's game, when you're watching the game, you saw some blocks that were really... Hall of Fame quality, like by Matthews and McLaughlin of the Raiders. Oh, that uh, on, on, on George's touchdown run there in the fourth quarter, uh, Matthews pancaked McLaughlin. And, you know, George got the offensive rookie uh, player of the week uh, in the AFC and, and got a lot of credit this week. But you got to give credit to that, Houston, to that Tennessee offensive line. They did an excellent job last week, and they're starting to do a good job here today. And they're really starting to do an excellent job getting Eddie George freed up. 
four carries for 33 yards in this drive. He's up to 63 yards rushing for the game on 12 carries. McNair sprinting. Loses the ball, and the Oilers get it at the 11-yard line. So McNair holding the ball, I guess, precariously as it slapped away, but quickly on the ball was his H-back, Frank Wycheck. Well, again, we talked about earlier, they're trying to get McNair out on the corner, and he did a little bootleg action. You couldn't see it, then rolls out to his right. Right there, he's, he's kind of trying to fake like he's going to throw the football, and then he's going to run it, and when he, when he goes to fake like he's going to throw it, the ball comes out of his hands. They're lucky to get it. Wycheck got the, the recovery. Here's Jeff Fisher, the 38-year-old head coach, who has a very simple directive to his players on game day. He said, I don't want you to think about a lot of stuff. You've practiced well. You've learned well. Go out and have fun, and you'll play your best football. Right. He, he preaches that, and, and he preaches confidence. And I think that philosophy by him gives his players confidence. He says, hey, you guys are ready. You've worked hard. Now just go play the game. So on the run and the subsequent recovery, it's a first down for the Oilers with 43 seconds to play in the half. Here's a rush on McNair, and off goes Steve McNair. Still holding the ball loosely in one hand. He's going to lose it again as on the run he gets down to the 11-yard line and the Oilers call a timeout with 32 seconds to play. How much time in the half? Steve McNair goes to the sideline to get some counsel now. With just 32 seconds left, you don't want to miss a scoring opportunity like this, Jim. So Jeff Fisher is really working with his quarterback, and there is the 17-year veteran Dave Craig, the backup, who is very invaluable in, in coaching also. This oh, guy knows everything he is to know about football. He's like Marino. You know, he's seen it all on defense, and he can be a big help to a young quarterback like McNair because he'll see things from the sideline that McNair doesn't see on the field. Second down, Oilers need six, they need 11 for a touchdown. 32 seconds to play in the half. McNair throws in a big rush by Miami as they got the rookie from the outside, Derek Rogers coming quickly. McNair was looking at Eddie George, but he really didn't have time to set up and throw. Yeah, Miami had the rush on him here. They're blitzing their, their linebackers. Derek Rogers, number 59, right there is coming off the corner. Nobody blocks him. Little late with the hit. But I'm sure McNair felt him breathing down his neck. When you get down here, you got to blitz on defense. You got to do something special. This is where you have inside the opposing 20. You see blitzes on every down, usually. Eighth play of the drive coming up. George starts to swing in motion. McNair, a quick timing throw and not close. And here's a penalty marker being thrown in. The umpire comes in to throw it in. Often that's a holding call. Delay. Offense. Five yard penalty. Remains third down. And apparently the play clock, Jim, ran out before the snap of the ball. So yeah. you know, this is just this will kill you as a coach. When you get down here in this kind of field position. To 28 seconds. 28 seconds on the play clock. When you get down here, the last thing you want to do is have a turnover or a penalty or make some kind of a mistake because you got a chance to score here. You're going to get something. Don't foul it up. you got to execute down here. They're very much in Del Greco field goal range. McNair on third down and 11. 28 seconds to play in the half. Watch Ronnie Harmon, 33. And here's McNair calling a quarterback draw. And McNair is all the way down to the five-yard line. He's very close to a first down. He might have one. And again, timeout is signal with 18 seconds to play. So while they unpile, we'll find out if there's a first down. Don Crickey with Jim Mora back at Miami where Jeff Fisher saw the quarterback draw, which he put in specially for this game, come up just short of a first down. And on fourth down with just 18 seconds to play in the half, they're going to put in the sure shot, El Del Greco, to try to add three on a field goal. Yeah, I think it's important here that they get a sure three points, and they're going to do that. They don't want to take any chances. This is going to be a tight game, a low-scoring game. They don't want to, they don't want to uh, lose any opportunities to get points. Del Greco swings into the ball, and Del Greco again powers it through. 
And the Miami players are all talking about how precarious the footing is on that dirt infield with football cleats. And that Del Greco's had no problems, two field goal attempts. He's hit them both, and it's now a 10 to 3 game. The Tennessee Oilers in the lead. At halftime, we'll be going back to Greg in New York. The whole gang is there for a report on week two as the Jets, who shocked the world in week one of Seattle, apparently uh, taking the measure of the Bills, although the last week report he got it was a three-point game, New York. And right here, it's a seven-point game as the Oilers continue to lead the Dolphins 10-3. Miami's lost momentum, Jim. There's no question on yeah, offense. There's no question about it, and, and I, the key has been the, uh, the, the the Oilers getting that running game going. Now Buffalo has taken the lead over the Jets. Andre Reid with a touchdown reception. The Patriots continue to lead the Colts. Week two is an important week, isn't it, Jim? I mean, you start out 2-0, and, oh, and you've got a big leg up and making the playoffs. You start out 0-2, oh and, and you are in a deep hole. It's, it's, a, it's a big week. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're 0-1 oh and after that first game, and, and now you go into a, in, in the second week and you come out 0-2, oh like you say, Don, you know, then everybody's going to start saying, well, teams that are 0-2 oh don't make the playoffs, and, and that's kind of a plays on your psyche as a player and a coach. And uh, So, it, it, you know, you got to come back. If you lose that first one, it's important to come back and win that second one. You don't want to be 0-2. Oh Coach Titka with his home debut in New Orleans failing San Diego. Here is a short squib kick. They don't want to give a run back to anybody, but up back gets it, and the ball is out to the 43. I don't know how smart that is because one Marino throw in your field goal attempt range. Ten well, seconds left to go in the half. I think it's a good idea, Don. I, you know, you don't want to take any chances of getting any kind of a, of a run back. They only got ten seconds to go, and... Uh, They'd have to complete one, a pretty good throw, a pretty pretty long throw, get a timeout for a chance for a field goal. I think that's a good strategy by the Oilers. That's why you've been a coach most of your life, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why I'm not a coach now. <laughs> Marino we'll with see what happens. <laughs> 10 of 15 for 132 yards so far, but in that opening drive, he hit 5 of 5. And then they came away with a missed field goal. So since then, they have not had the guts to run offense they had early in the game. Marino in the shotgun. Oilers look like they got 20 guys playing defense, don't they? With all everybody backed off the line. They're in that three band defense. Start prior to the snap, number 66, offense. Five yard penalty, still first down. Ten, ten seconds to go in the first half. All you want to do here as a defensive football team is not let them score a touchdown. So you're going to play your secondary guys about as deep as you can get them. Let them catch something in front of you and come up and make the tackle. They've only got 10 seconds. Going to be tough for them to get a, a timeout and kick the field goal. Just don't let them score a touchdown. That would be a disaster. That was Greg Williams we were just looking at, the D coordinator for the Tennessee Oilers on the sideline. Said the really get an idea what kind of people he's got. He doesn't have one guy even late for a meeting on his defense. Here is a throw down field. And they get out of bounds at about the 47-yard line. And Marino with four seconds left now. You don't have time to do anything. You either got long field goal, you go for the end zone. Now, what he's got to do here is too, it's too far to kick. They're on the <laughs> defensive back. Yeah, they're on the 46-yard line. The only thing he can do here is sling it down there and try to get, you know, like the, the Hail Mary, the alley-oop, something like that, and, and get lucky and, and uh, get some of the ends or get a tip pass. But uh, that's about the only chance they have right now. Or hope for a defensive penalty on the play. Half can't end on a defensive penalty. That's right. If that happened, they'd get another shot. Marino dropping back. The Oilers have people standing in the end zone. Here's Marino letting it go. Still strong of arm, a jump ball, and incomplete. I'll tell you, the Dolphin had his hands on the ball for a moment and almost uh, took it in, Charles Jordan. But the first half ends on a long ball by Marino that's incomplete. And so the Tennessee Oilers take a 10-3 lead after the first 30 minutes of play. And now, for the Valley's for 10 straight points to take a 10 to 3 halftime lead. Don Cricky with Jim Mora back in Miami. A game of momentum. Marino upset with his coach, Jimmy Johnson, who talked about the possibility of replacing Marino with Craig Erickson if he played poorly. Came out red hot. He's 11 for 17 for the half. 149 yards, but Jim, only three points for the Dolphin offense. Yeah, they've had two opportunities down there. One time they missed a field goal, then they kicked a field goal, but but, Ma but Marino's playing very well, but what's happening now is, is the is the uh, Oilers are getting their running game going. They're controlling the clock, and Marino can't get back on the field. And Eddie George picked up speed. Eddie George started slowly. They shut him down, but then all of a sudden, he started to really roll in the second quarter, and this was his best carry, cutting back. 
13 yards and right on in for the go-ahead touchdown. Well, he's a great cut cutback runner, and uh, it, that offensive line is starting to uh, take over up front and 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 wearing out that uh, that uh, Dolphin smaller group up there. They got a small defense; they're fast, but that Oiler offensive line is big and powerful, and they're moving them around right now. And the Dolphins also know that the Oilers can play in heat. They've trained in a lot of humidity in uh, Middle Tennessee, and uh, they're ready for this humid weather also. As the rain's holding off, looking at the Coors Light halftime statistics. Anything jump out at you there? Well, I think the key thing there, Don, is the rushing yardage. Tennessee is starting to run the football, and they've rushed for 104 yards from Miami's 34. Miami's doing a good job throwing the football, but again, they can't get the ball back because Tennessee's controlling the clock, especially in that second quarter, by running the football. If Tennessee can do that, Miami's going to have a tough second half. Jimmy Johnson, the man who, when he took over the Dolphins, said, we're going to win, and everybody knows it in the league. Last year, they finished 8-8, eight and eight, did not make the playoffs. And the Oilers also were an 8-8 eight and eight team last year. As here is the kickoff now to start the second half of play. It comes downfield, and Mel Gray runs it back for Hughes for the Tennessee Oilers. He's out to the 25-yard line and knocked down there. So the big, tough Oiler offensive line comes out after a 21-yard return by number 21, Mel Gray. There is McNair as you look at his uh, stats compared to Marino McNair with limited throws in the first half, but no mistakes. Well, like we said, you know, Dan Marino has been right on target uh, this first half, but in the, in the first quarter, uh, Miami had the ball most of the time. They controlled the clock, and the second quarter has been just the other way around. And for, for Marino to be effective, he's got to be out there throwing a football. And Tennessee's going to try to control that clock, have patience, long drives, and not let that Miami offense out there. Miami offense was out the first quarter and a half almost entirely now. McNair throws on first down, and he is intercepted at the 35-yard line. So McNair with a major mistake to start the third quarter, and Marino and the Dolphins take over the ball at the Tennessee 35-yard line. The Oiler coach. Well, Buckley is the guy that got the ball, Jim. Well, the Oiler coaches talk about having patience, and they come out here the first play of the second half and throw the football. It's not a good throw. It's a low throw. Buckley had good tight coverage and made the made the pick. Why would they go to a play like this with George running through him in the second quarter? Well, they probably say, well, maybe that uh, that Miami's going to gear up to stop the running game. Perhaps we can get something going throwing the football early so that Miami can't just zero in on the running game. And Terrell Buckley gets his first interception of the new season. And most importantly for the Dolphins, he gives his team possession at the 35-yard line of Tennessee. Marino, he's going to do the same thing. He fires, swings it out, and he overshoots his guy. Is coming out of the backfield with Dotson. Out here wants an interference call on middle linebacker Baron Wortham, who was covering on the play. Marino has such a terrific ability, Jim, to look downfield, and then when there's nothing there, to quickly swing it off accurately. Yeah, but what you see right here is, is Joe Bowden right there, the outside linebacker for the Oilers. He's coming hard off the corner, and he gets a good shot on Marino. He got a real good shot on Dan Marino. And that brings up second down and 10 for the Dolphins at the Tennessee 35. Marino shooting off target. A misconnection with his receiver route as uh, McDuffie was running an out and up. He was flying down the sideline. It looked like uh, Dan Marino, Jim, was throwing an out pattern. Uh, Dar yeah, Darrell Lewis right here, the, the right corner, is playing up in a press or bump and run alignment. So what you try to do when that's the case is you try to get your receiver to run by him and go deep. But there was a little bit of miscommunication right there because McDuffie was running upfield and Marino was throwing the out route. Those yeah. are things you got to read on the move. After getting this big opportunity to start the third quarter, the interception by Buckley in the good field position, Marino and the Dolphins now have a third and ten. Quick dump pass, running in the open field, and ahead for the first down. Or is he? No, he's going to be just short of it. Bernie Parmalee, another of those good backs, as uh, Jimmy Johnson continues to rotate his backs, but the spot is short of the first down, and... They're not going to go for it, it doesn't look like it. They send out the regular offense. Yeah, they're going to go for it. They're going to go for it on fourth down. They're sending in there Dotson and, and Drayton, and uh, 
They're going to go for it. Not going to go for the field goal. Oh, no, right. Yeah. Yes, right. They're going to go for the first down here. The first down. They remember earlier in the game they had a very similar play. They needed a yard, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was stopped behind the line of scrimmage, and the Oilers took over the ball. Fourth down. A run blitz. Another run, and it looks like the Oilers stopped him again. So two fourth down tries by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Jeff Fisher sees his young, fast, aggressive defense stop Miami. So Jimmy Johnson sees his team with a golden opportunity after the interception, but again, no point. You don't have to live thirsty. Life is a sport. Drink it up by the Ford F-150. Strength after strength after strength. By KFC, where you can now grab the Twister, a whole new twist on eating KFC. And by Sealy, posturepedic support only from Sealy. On short yardage defense, what you've got to do is you've got to commit your defensive backs to stopping the run. And the Oilers do a great job of it here with number 31, Marcus Robertson. Watch, watch him attack that gap between the center and the guard right there. Nobody blocks him. Nobody blocks him, and he makes the tackle. Terrific play, terrific defense by the uh, Tennessee Oilers. Well drawn up. Marcus Robertson attacking the gap. And a second fourth down try of this game by the Dolphins is short. McNair this time hands off and he goes to the money. This time it's Rodney Thomas sprinting out of the backfield. And Rodney Thomas is ahead for a gain of about 11 yards in a first down. Middle linebacker Zach Thomas knocked him down. The, the difference in this ball game right now, Don, is the fact that the Oiler offensive line is dominating the line of scrimmage on offense, and when Miami has the ball, their offensive line is not. They couldn't pick up two short yardage situations when they should have, and this is the difference. The difference right now, and in the last quarter and a half, has been the offensive blocking of the Tennessee Oilers. Here's Eddie George. Hit at the line of scrimmage, still at 6'3", 242 pounds. He leans ahead and goes low and gets ahead for a gain of almost four yards. Darrell Gardner, a huge defensive tackle, number 92, who many felt was an underachiever at Baylor. But he was a high draft choice in the first round. How consistent is he, Jim? Well, he's, he's played probably better than most scouts thought he was going to play uh, when he came out of Baylor. He was very inconsistent, very much of an underachiever at Baylor. But Jimmy Johnson picked him in the first round last year. He's been a starter for him ever since, and he's playing pretty well. Second down to Rises. For McNair and the Oilers to lead the game in the third quarter, 10 to 3. Ronnie Harmon gets a look, turns it up. And good, quick Miami defenders cordon off the side run. And then Zach Thomas is there to finish it off. So that brings up third down for Steve McNair, whose last throw, you remember, was intercepted. Well, one of the two rookies that, uh, that start for this defense is uh, Derek Rogers, an outside linebacker from Arizona State. We're going to get a shot of him here. He's very quick, very active, tough and smart. Jimmy Johnson likes him. There he is right there, number 59. He plays that right outside linebacker spot. Third round draft choice who spent four years in the U.S. Air Force before he played college football. Never played in high school. Here's the throw, and McNair is again low and off target on a third down try. The Dolphin defense holds, and the former Dolphin, Reggie Roby, comes back out to punt the ball for Tennessee. So not much happening on offense here in the third quarter with 11.20 to play in the quarter. Score remains as it was at the half, 10-3, Tennessee. Reggie Romy, who's boomed a lot of long punts in this stadium over the years, now looking down at Charles Jordan, the return man for the Dolphins. Well hit ball, a high spiral that Jordan comes up on at the 10-yard line. Bear catches the last second, now throwing a penalty marker, but he signaled at the left, absolute last second. When you signal for a fair catch, you've got to make a, you've got to make it definite. You've got to get that hand up over your head, and you've got to wave it. Let's see how the officials rule on it. The question here is whether he signaled fair catch, whether, whether that was it. Oh, man. The Euler pass, the kick covers got snookered on this one. This is an illegal call. The last second when the guy's right on him. Interference. With the opportunity to make a catch on the kicking team, 15-yard penalty 
Automatic first down. So Jeff Fisher is curious, but it doesn't help. The Dolphins will get the ball at their own end. You know, this was not a good call by the officials. When you're signaling for a fair catch, as Charles Jordan does right there, you've got to get the arm up over the head, clearly over the head, and you've got to wave it. That's what it states in the, in the rule book, and he did neither right there. Not a good call by the official. Looks like he was just a quick wave to somebody in the stands, but the call goes with the Dolphins, and on the penalty yardage, they'll start at their 26-yard line. McDuffie caught five passes for Miami in the first quarter, has not caught one since. As uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, again, not much yardage. This is a lot of booze now. I don't know if it's for Kareem or the call. Kareem stopped short twice on fourth down runs in this game. Baron Wortham got him there. And there is Craig Erickson, who Jimmy Johnson recruited out of nearby West Palm Beach, Florida, Newman High School. And he went to Miami and led the Hurricanes, the University of Miami, to a couple national championships. And he had a great preseason, Johnson said. Uh, Johnson uh, said he had a terrific preseason, and that's why he felt like he could put him in at any time. Marino looks, gets rid of the ball beautifully just before he's hit, and the ball is all the way out now to the 41-yard line, again on the play of 16 yards and a first down as Tamur Barnes stopped Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Marino waiting the last second and getting rid of it. You know, what they've done on both first and second down here, Don, is they've come out in the shotgun. Come right out in the shotgun on the first play, they ran a draw, the second play a pass, but they're coming out and just saying, hey, we're gonna throw the football. Now Marino. Back there again. Yeah, he's back in the shotgun, calling out to his wide receivers. There are three deployed, steps in, hands over, throws over the middle, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is knocked down at the 49-yard line. By, line. by defensive end, James Roberman. And Roberson cannot, uh, he does stop him short of the first down, but there was a gain of about four on the play. What Miami is doing here now is they're running no huddle offense, like a two-minute offense. They're not huddling up. Marino is uh, calling the play at the line of scrimmage. And I think, I think it's bothering that Oiler defense a little bit. See, they have to be kind of basic over there on defense. Marino looking around. They're giving him a lot of time. Now he throws up the middle. The ball looked like it might have been partially been tipped as O.J. McDuffie was the intended target downfield. So that will bring up third down and about three for the Dolphins at their 49-yard line. Jimmy Johnson changing strategies here in the third quarter, going to a hurry-up all-pass offense. Yeah, he felt like he had to get something going. Their offense hadn't been doing too well, so he figured, well, I better get something, you know, get something different to get this offense going. So he came out in a no-huddle shotgun throwing a football. Marino again checking with his receivers as he looks at the Oiler defense. Here comes a blitz. Marino stands in. Another completion. First down Miami as he gets the ball to Irving Spikes. Down to the 41-yard line. An 11-yard gain on third down. First down for the Dolphins. On the tackle, Darrell Lewis and Renee Stewart. What happens when you when you run a no huddle like this, what it does is it makes the defense stay fairly basic in their defensive calls. They don't have an opportunity to huddle up and call their defense, too, so they have to stay pretty pretty simple. And they can't make substitution. There's a handoff. This one to Irving Spikes as he runs the ball down to the 31-yard line. Usually things like this work for a while, and then the defense catches up with it. Yeah, the defense, I'm sure that the Oiler defense has worked against the no-huddle uh, offense in practice, so they're going to get used to it here a minute, get, it, get adjusted, get the calls in, and... and react to it a little bit better than they are right now. Again, a running play. This time it's Bernie Parmalee, and he's ahead for a Dolphins first down as he takes it to the 26-yard line of the Oilers. So the Oilers defense, Jim, clearly rocked back on its heels by Dan Marino and the Dolphins coming out in a no-huddle offense to start the third quarter. Yeah, now those players down there look like they're frustrated that they can't do all the things that they want to do when they have a chance to huddle up and get a call. Here's an all-out blitz, and the Dolphins pick it up. A home run ball to the end zone. Incomplete. Three yards deep. Dolphins protest interference. Intended receiver was the veteran Fred Barnett, number 80. Reno says, let's get back in formation and go again. Look at the blitz pickup, though. A really a crushing block. Well, that's the key to the, uh, to the play right here. Here comes the blitzer right there. Marino's got a lot of time. Left tackle does a good job right there. 
And we have a player down on the field with uh, 7.51 to play in the third quarter. Gary's okay as he comes off and takes a breather. And now the Dolphins set up with a second down and 10 play coming up as they remain in this series in the shotgun, trailing the Tennessee Oilers 10 to 3. Marino again gets time. This time he delivers to McDuffie. His first catch since the first quarter is good for 14 yards in a Miami first down. Lenoy Jones finally got him. This is a crossing route to number 81, O.J. McDuffie. They're playing a zone defense. There should be a linebacker sitting right there in that hook zone, but there wasn't. And it was an easy completion for the Dolphins. 57. Jones finally got him. Here's Marino again. He gets all day. He could count the house, and finally they sack Marino, who has been unbelievably well protected by the offensive line of uh, the Miami Dolphins, led by center Tim Ruddy. They've Pratt Lyons right here, the left end. I believe it's Pratt Lyons or Kenny Holmes is going to make the play. See, now Marino has to scramble, so Kenny Holmes is coming in from that left side and got the sack. Brad Lyons, a very highly regarded fourth-round draft choice out of Troy State. He's from Fort Worth, Texas. He had a sack last week. Here's a throw and a catch. McDuffie, a beautifully executed play. But on second down, the throw of the first down, there could be a face mask call, though, as a penalty marker is thrown in. Charles Jordan comes across and makes the catch. Personal foul, face mask, Oilers, first down and goal for Miami. Well, Tamar Barnes right here is covering Charles Jordan. And, and we said earlier that Dan Marino throws that little slant route as good as anybody, and he hit him right there. Now, Tamar Barnes, what he's got to do is he's got to read that route, and he's got to react a lot quicker than he did right there. you got to read that slant route and jump on it. Now right up close to the goal line. The shotgun at point blank range. First and goal, this is the 12th play of the drive coming up for the Dolphins at the five yard line of Tennessee. Marino checking with people, is he changing the play, Jim? Well, he's audibleizing, he's changed the plays depending upon what he sees on defense. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar runs, he takes a couple hard shots and gets back maybe to the line of scrimmage. Hasn't been a whole lot happening for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar trying to run the ball. No, he hasn't had a good day, and uh, that, that Oiler defense has been swarming to him. A lot of people on the ball, a lot of people through the football. But right now, what uh, what Miami is doing is they're they're lining up in that shotgun, and, 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 and Marino's looking over the defense. He's seeing what they're giving him. He's, he's audibleizing to the right play, and he's taking advantage of it. They keep trying to run the ball, but as you see, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar averaging less than two yards a carry. Second and goal. Marino likes McDuffie down here. He relies on him. Here is Marino taking a look. He fires to the end zone. Incomplete. Beautifully defended on the play by side. Tamur Barnes, who had been cut by the Oilers, then brought back. They thought he was a little bit immature at one point. He missed meetings or came late. Now they see he's a model citizen and a very good player. Yeah, the Oilers are coming with the blitz right there, and, and that time Barnes read the slant route. He read the slant route. The coverage was a lot tighter, and he was able to break it up. You know, you, you, you tighten up your coverage the closer you get to the goal line right here, and he was playing that well. Now Marino again sets up in the shotgun. 14th play of the drive. Parmalee in the backfield with him. Third down and goal from just inside the five. Marino looks. Here comes the rush. Marino hurrying. Fires. It's incomplete. Dropped in the end zone by Charles Jordan. So it was on target. Marino's throw, but there was a drop on the play, and the field goal unit comes out. Well, Jordan's going to be coming over here from the left side of your screen. Marino's got decent protection. He makes a nice throw right in Jordan's hands. you got to catch those. And how? Marino has some nice passing numbers in that drive. It's 6 of 10 for 62 yards. But again, no touchdown for the Dolphins. They've been kept out of the end zone all game long, looking now for their second field goal, which is on the way and driven through by Mare. 
You know, the Dolphins drive long and hard and come away with just three, and the Oilers continue to lead the game. A 15-play, 70-yard drive, but only a field goal for the Dolphins as number 88 Jordan had a ball, Jim, that it looked like he should have caught. Well, the ball was thrown a little bit behind him, but if you're an NFL receiver and that ball hits you in the hands like it did Jordan, you got to make that catch. Excellent kickoff by Mate as uh, Mel Gray downs the ball, and the Tennessee Oilers will go first and 10 from their 20 as they lead 10 to 6. Complete pass for Dan Marino, but Charles Jordan should have had that. The Miami receivers are not quite the, the quality of group that, that, that Marino has had in the past when he had Clayton and Duper and some of those guys. Yeah, as he was telling us yesterday, Jim, he had Clayton and Duper. They were all together for 10 straight years. What numbers they put up. Now the Oilers go to the run, and Eddie George protecting the ball takes on tacklers and gets to the 25-yard line as the Patriots continue to lead. Washington winning at Pittsburgh, so the Steelers struggling again at home. Cordell Stewart talked about going to the Hall of Fame someday, Jimmy. First, he's got to yeah. be an adequate starting quarterback. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's, he hasn't done much yet. He's had two opportunities, two starts, and he hasn't done very much at all. Eddie George started to heat up running the ball for Jeff Fisher's Oilers in the second quarter. It's second down in the long four. Back to Eddie George. Cut back run, and George, here's a penalty marker, fired in from the back judge. John Wooden comes up to make the tackle on George. Did he see a holding? We'll see as the clock is stopped now with 4.36 to play. He did see holding against the Oilers. 4.36 to play in the third quarter. The Oilers, you know, what, what they got to do right here. Holding, number 89, offense. 10-yard penalty, remaining second down. Yeah, you know, what they got to do here is they've got to they've got to do what they're doing. They've got to control the football. They've got to run the football. They've got to use up the clock. Keep Miami's offense on the bench. But when you're doing and be patient, be conservative. But when you're doing that, you can't make mistakes. You can't turn the ball over. You can't have critical penalties. And right there, they had a critical penalty. You got to execute when you're when you're when you're playing this kind of offense. You've got to execute. You can't make mistakes. You can't beat yourself. And they want to keep their young quarterback out of pressure situation, Steve McNair, but he's in a pressure situation now. They'll have to execute here as McNair with second down and 15 deep in his own end, back at his 15-yard line. Hand off. This is uh, Rodney Thomas running the ball. He gets it out to about the 22-yard line. Zach Thomas, coming back from a broken leg, has been in almost the entire game for Miami. Well, Zach Thomas told us yesterday, he says, I read the guards in the center, and they take me to the football. I look at them first, and I look at the back. Now, what happened there is everything was going to his left, but then the back had a back. Something's wrong with his helmet. He, he's been in almost every step of the way. They were wondering how much he'd be able to play because he's been out over a month with the leg fracture. Third down and six. McNair in trouble, rolling out. And he has run down. Now he gets the ball away, but he throws it poorly too low. A good defensive effort, though. Coming hard with Anthony Harris, number 51, rushing Steve McNair. He was looking at rookie Derek Mason. McNair got away for the moment, but then he had to throw the ball, and he threw it errantly. Here comes Jason Taylor, number 99, from the backside, 51, the left outside linebacker's putting the pressure on McNair. Look at Jason get that hit right there. You can make that kind of hit on the quarterback when he's outside the pocket. Had he have been in the pocket right then, they might have called roughing the passer. That was actually a pretty good play by McNair getting the ball away. But he got it away low, and that means that Charles Jordan, who dropped the, what seemed to be a touchdown pass, is now back to take Reggie Roby's punt. Roby kicks it far and deep, back to the 24-yard line. Jordan drops it. Penalty markers thrown in. There's going to be a blocking foul on the Dolphins. This will come back as Jordan runs the ball well. Here's another penalty coming in. Maybe we'll have offsetting. Who knows? We'll let him sort it out. It was a 51-yard punt, a 26-yard return, but it's unlikely it'll stand. Bill Carollo, the referee. The Tennessee Oilers, Jim, all helping the officials, pointing at Miami. <laughs> yeah. Line, yep, legal box. Both penalties are on the... Uh... Now we'll see if Marino goes right back to that shotgun that took them 70 yards and 15 Holding. plays. Number 24 on the return. That penalty is declined. Illegal block in the back. Number 57. 
That penalty is accepted. 10 yard penalty. First down. So the Dolphins are set back on the blocking penalty. Next Sunday, more exciting NFL action beginning at 12 noon Eastern time with the NFL on NBC. Most of you will see Brett Favre and the defending world champion Green Bay Packers take on these Miami Dolphins at Green Bay. Others will see the Seattle Seahawks go against the Indianapolis Colts or regional action. Check your local listings for the game in your area. That's more NFL action on NBC next Sunday beginning at 12 noon Eastern time. Now two big backs are in, probably the pass block. Jim Mora as they have uh, Irving Spikes and Dwayne Dotson in with, Mick, with uh, Dan Marino on the backfield. Yeah, it looks like that they're going to come out in the shotgun and do what they did on the last series. No huddle, call the play at the line of scrimmage, let Marino see what the defense has given him, and then adjust to it. So they're going to need to protect him. They got Spikes in. No, they're not going to. They're going to the eye formation with Marino under the center. Stadium goes quiet as Marino calls signals on first down. Here's a blitz, and Marino is finally leveled on a clean hit as it was Lemansky Hall, a young linebacker from Alabama, coming unblocked. They tried to get free up people. They said, we got to get people free and clean on Marino if we can. You're going to see Lemansky Hall coming in from the left side of your screen right there. Number 35, Irving Spikes, was supposed to block him, but he didn't get the block. So now Miami is positioned back at their 10-yard line. First the blocking foul on the punt return, the getting a 26-yard return. Now the clean sack. And Reno in the shotgun will be throwing from inside his 5-yard line. This time he steps up, fires over the middle, and makes the connection all the way out to the 26-yard line. Fumble on the play. And it looks like Rene Stewart has the ball for Houston, or for the Tennessee Oilers. Old habits die hard. They were there for 37 years. And it's, are they going to give the ball to the Oilers or not? They're talking about it. Apparently they are. The Oilers at least are coming off in jubilation. I think and they're going to give it to them. Yeah, they're, they're definitely going to give it to them. Grip of the receiver. Good throw and catch. They're but throwing the ball to Barnett. Number 32, Barnes is ripping the ball out of there. Boy, that's a heck of a play by Barnes. As he's making the tackle, a high tackle, he strips the ball out of there with his right arm. Take a look at that right there. So the Oilers, who stripped the ball from Miami, trying to come away with points on this possession, but so far, nothing happening on offense for Tennessee. McNair, there's the quarterback draw. Right up the middle, and McNair is down to the 19-yard line. A knockout tackle put on by the strong safety, Sean Wooden, short of the first down, but it gives uh, Del Greco a much shorter field goal attempt as the gain on the play was 13 yards. Well, they did run the quarterback draw to McNair. That's a quarterback draw all the way. and no intention to throw the football. Tremendous job of coming up and making the tackle by number 22. Jimmy, I don't know if you want your quarterback doing that a whole lot. I do. If it's going to help you win the game, let him do it. He gets paid good money. Yeah. You'd like him in there for four yeah, quarters. You don't want him to do it every play. But, but as you uh, said, McNair's a tough guy. He ran for 33 touchdowns in college. Big, strong guy. He can take some of that pounding. Del Greco sends the field goal straight down the middle. There isn't a better kicker in football than Al Del Greco. He is machine-like in his accuracy. And Jimmy Johnson now sees his Dolphins down by seven again as it goes to 13 to six. Sean Wooden was the, uh, the the player who came up and put the hit on McNair that time. A good high tackle stuck him right in the chest. 24-yarder and a 37-yarder for Del Greco today. Two for two as his team leads by seven. Follow the NFL action here on NBC, NBCSports.com. Our own Randy Cross writes about the Steve Young situation and the issues surrounding Jimmy Johnson and Marino here with the Dolphins, plus a pictorial sideshow of Mike Ditka's career, and you can vote in our weekly poll with some starting quarterbacks. On the shelf, we ask, who is the best backup QB in the league? It's all at NBCSports.com. A lot of guys are getting a chance to see if they're the best backup, Jim. Wasn't there five starting this week? Back there, there, yeah, there, more than I've ever seen. And, you know, it's amazing for the second week of the season. Now, you can understand this maybe later on the season when these guys get wore down and, and that type of thing. But this is only the second week. That means these guys were either put out in the preseason 
for in the first game. So uh, a lot of backup quarterbacks are getting opportunities to show what they can do. In fact, in San Francisco, they're down to the number three guy, Druckenmiller. As uh, Del Greco approaches the kickoff, it flows off the tee. Let's look at the rushing numbers in this game as the Dolphins have gone almost exclusively to the pass as the game is worn on. Uh, Jimmy Johnson's team outrushed by the Tennessee offense, 146 to 48. So three to one advantage running the ball. Now Jimmy Johnson would like to run the football. He'd, he'd, he'd like to run the ball more than he throws it. He's not happy with that. High spinning kick. And coming down with the ball is uh, Irving spikes as he's right up the middle and across the 30 and Irving breaks it all the way out to the 37. A good return for the Dolphins. But Dan Marino set to go to work from his 36-yard line, a 33-yard kickoff return by Spice. It was very important for the Oilers to get some points out of that turnover that right there. They would have liked to have gotten the end zone with a touchdown, but they did get the three points. That gives them a seven-point lead. So Miami would have to score twice to go ahead. One touchdown and the extra point would just give them a tie. So yeah, that, was, that was critical for the Oilers. Time of factor now in the third quarter as we're winding down. 32 seconds to play in the quarter. Marino, a guy historically who can make it happen fast. We'll try again to do it from the shotgun. But they've got to be somewhat discouraged, Jim. In fact, they went 70 yards in 15 plays the last time and only got a field goal. Here's McDuffie making a catch under the zone out to the 42. He got about four or five. Darrell Lewis was the tackler for Tennessee. Yeah, the Dolphins have had three opportunities down inside the, the red zone area, inside the 20, to convert to touchdowns. And in, in two of the three occasions, they had to kick a field goal. The third time they kicked a field goal, too, but he missed it. That was the first uh, attempt that, uh, that Mari had. And also looming large in the way this game's evolved, Jim, is the fact that twice on fourth down, the Dolphins end the ball with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and twice he was stopped, and the Oilers took over the ball. They'll come back with the fourth quarter as the end of the NFL and NBC continues. Don Cricky with Jim Mora as we get set to start the fourth quarter here in South Florida where the day has been beautiful from the outset. Weather forecast was with the possibility of thunderstorms moving in. But so far it's been ideal weather. Temperature in the low 80s. Humidity not too high. Marino taking a look. Lots of time and a very nicely caught ball. As coming down to get it was O.J. McDuffie. Now they're going to rule, wave it off. They're going to say he did not have it. Steve Jackson covering. And the, you can't say enough, though, really, about the pass blocking of Miami. The Colts never got to Marino last week, and Oilers have had a hard time doing it. Yeah, the, well, the, the, the Dolphins, you know, they work a lot on pass protection because they got a quarterback like Marino who's going to put the ball in the air a lot. So they've always been known for doing a good job of protecting Marino. Plus, he gets rid of the ball so quickly, he's just tough to get to. And their center, who's one of the best in the league, Tim Ruddy, calling all the pass blocking. The guy who had uh, 1470 FATs and is a straight-A student in engineering at Notre Dame. So you've got a smart guy at center as the throw is to Fred Barnett. And the ball is positioned at midfield, good for a first down. Well, again, you know, this, this is what they've done now. Earlier, they're, they're hitting the quick pass, and that corner has got to read this. Number 29, Daryl Lewis has got to say, hey, he's got to read. He's got to read the three-step drop. By You look at Marino, he takes a three-step step drop to throw that slant pass. As soon as you see that three-step drop, you got to jump on the receiver. This is a shot of Gary Stevens, the offensive coordinator for the Miami Dolphins. He told us yesterday, he says, he thinks their offense is going to be better than it was last year. Well, so far, they got only one touchdown last week and none so far today. Marino is going to be sacked all the way back at the 40-yard line. As they came with everybody, Lenoy Jones, one of these young guys you don't hear a lot about. All he does is make plays like he did last week against the Raiders. Young legs run fast, and Lenoy Jones beats the blockers. Well, jo Lenoy Jones, number 57, you're going to see him right there, right there, coming in on a blitz. And he's their, he's their nickel linebacker. He's the, he never plays, very seldom ever plays on first down or second down uh, when the offense is in a regular uh, set but when they get into a third down situation the offense is throwing the football he's going to be in the ball game he's a good cover guy and a good blitzer played for pat sullivan's horned frogs at tcu lenoy jones now in his second year dropping the throw dan marino in trouble he fires it downfield and there's a big hit put on and now a penalty marker is thrown back by marino 
As the Oilers are protesting, they were held. We'll see if Marino was hit late. Looks like the signal's against the Dolphins. Holding. Number 61, offense. 10-yard penalty. You got Tim Ruddy was just extolling. His offensive coordinators say if they had five guys like Tim Ruddy, they had the best offensive line of all time. It's Tim running, uh, Ruddy, number 91. Right there, he's blocking on uh, number 61. He's blocking on number 91, Josh Evans. And Josh had a good push up the middle. And Ruddy felt like he had to get him down some way, so he threw him down, and they called it. Well, as Weeb Eubank of the Jets used to say about uh, Joe Namath to his lineman, I don't care if you get penalized 10 yards or 10 miles. Don't let anybody get a clean shot on the QB. That's right. You're, you, you, sometimes you're saying, well, hey, I'll take the, I'll take the penalty. Uh, don't let him hit the quarterback. You know, you don't want him to hold. You don't want him to use that as an excuse. You know, sometimes they'll say, hey, well, coach, uh, you told me don't let him get a, a hit on the quarterback, so I'm going to hold the guy. And you don't want him to do that. But uh, as a last resort, sometimes you have to do it. But sometimes it just happens. Jim, do you get a lot of guys who come to you telling you a story of why things went wrong as a coach? Well, you do, but, you know, you discourage that. And, you just don't listen to him. You know, hey, just go play. Don't give me any excuses. Produce. And while we have a moment, we want to remind you that later this one month, Tiger Woods will lead the American team into Valderrama, Spain, as they try to reclaim the famed Ryder Cup from the top European golfers and Europe players' home turf. That's the Ryder Cup beginning September 27th on NBC Sports. What an event that is. Oh, man, I'd love to be over there. Well, I don't know if I should say that. I'd probably rather be, be here working for NBC, but that would be a great event to attend, and I'm sure it's going to be an awesome spectacle, spectacle on television. That, that, those guys really get excited. Those golfers get fired up and excited for that match. I mean, a lot of pride. It's more of a team sport, you know? The golf usually is individual, and this is a team. United States against the, the European countries, and a lot of pride, a lot of camaraderie involved. Yeah, the nationalism is, the banners are waved. As now, Dan Marino's waving to his receivers to get downfield for him, running deep patterns as Marino throws, and he has an open man splitting the secondary, and this McDuffie is still on his feet down to the 19-yard line as McDuffie ran right through a prevent defense for the Oilers, and Marino put the ball right on his hand. A good offensive play, a very poor defensive one. A very poor defensive play. In a situation like that, you've got to come up with the play. First of all, Marino had a lot of time to throw, but here comes McDuffie right there, and he's going to split the two deep coverage, and it was a perfect throw by Marino. 51 yards. So the Dolphins now threatening to tie the game, but they've been held out of the end zone. Again, they go with the big bat. All sorts of protection. Got to make the tackle right there. Looks like Marcus Robinson missed the tackle. Would have saved some yards. They've taken Kareem Abdul-Jabbar out. They're going with big backs. This is uh, Irving Spike running, and not for very much. Did get a couple of yards down close to the 15-yard line. A lot of time left in the game. 12 minutes and 10 seconds left to play. And the Tennessee Oilers continue to lead the Dolphins 13-6. to Jimmy Johnson, though, waiting for a touchdown. Yeah, you know that... Marino's close to the three. He got 295 yards. He's close to 300 yards. Got a big chunk, but on that last play. But Marino's, you know, one big play from getting these guys right back in the ball game. They're back in it now. If they can convert here for a touchdown, it's going to be a heck of a of an of a of a 12 minutes left here. It's going to be exciting. Marino takes a look, fires to the end zone, has an open man, and it's defended by Marcus Robertson. Red Barnett was the intended receiver, and Robertson. Actually got hit by the ball as he was covering Barnett. Guy was a first-team All-Pro player, Marcus Robertson. Yeah, again, Marino gets a lot of time to throw. And Barnett here runs an inside route. Barnett looks like they were doubling him. and He was Barnett. not looking back. I mean, that's almost shielding. No, he, you know, he, that, there's, he can shield. Sometimes you, you don't have that opportunity. He's, he's got him man for man right there. So he's not going to look back at the ball. And, uh, hey, the ball hits him in the back. That's pretty good pass to think sometimes. Well, it was there. The official right on top of it said it was clean all the way, and that brings up third down. Very big down as Marino and the Dolphins don't want to have to settle for another field goal. Marino looks. Here's the rush. He dumps it off, and it's Aaron. And again, Miami is unable to get it into the end zone, and Marino's furious about something, maybe his own poor throw. He's, I don't think so. I think he's, he's, either mad at, he's either mad at the receivers for running an incorrect route, not looking. I don't think he's mad at the protection. The protection wasn't great, but it looks to me like he's upset with something the receivers did. And this is interesting, Jim. Jimmy Johnson saying, we're going to go for it. 
Fourth down, they need seven. Trailing in the game by seven points in the fourth quarter. Still held out of the end zone. The Dolphins offense, point production limited to two field goals. You got to see call here by Jimmy. Here's an all-out blitz. Marino lost it to the end zone, and it's incomplete. A foul call is signaled against. Denard Walker, a rookie defensive back. It will be first down Miami. Wow. I didn't see that. I, I was looking for, for a penalty down there for a pass interference penalty. I didn't see it. That official got a lot better view than I do. Well, we want you to watch it again and assess it. That's Denard Walker, who... Uh, what did he do wrong? Well, he just he just got his left hand on the receiver. He got his shoulder in there when the ball was in the air. That's pass interference. You see it right okay, there? You see him get you that go. right shoulder yep. in there? He gets that right shoulder in there. You, you can go for the ball. You got as much right as anybody, but you can't obstruct the receiver from getting it. Great second look. It showed him blocking the receiver off, and now they go to the run. Fighting hard, and the Dolphins get in. Finally, a touchdown. This time, it's Irving Spikes. So the Dolphins, an extra point away from tying the game in the fourth quarter. Well, that was a gutsy call by Jimmy Johnson, and it worked on fourth down. You know, that kind of a play, you're either going to get... You, you got a good chance for, for a pass interference call or something like that. He just kind of laid it up there. The receiver re ran underneath it. And, and, and a lot of times, you're going you're gonna to draw pass interference here. But the big play, Jim Moore, on that drive, more than any other, was the 51-yard pass play, Marino to McDuffie, right through a prevent defense. There nope. were six defensive backs out there. No question about it. And then, then, one, then Robertson missed the tackle, which could have held it to a lesser game. Mare hits the point after McDuffie having a heck of a day. He has eight receptions for 135 yards. But here is Spikes, a big back, in for Kareem. He takes it in. The Dolphins get into the end zone as Marino's right arm gets them downfield, and finally, Spike takes it in. It's tied to 13 all. Don Cricky with Jim Mora as the Dolphins now kick the ball off. A tremendous kickoff boomed into the end zone and out of it. Lindo Mare boots it in and out for a touchback, and the Oilers will have the ball at their 20 as the NFL on NBC continues. They're trying to move the Dolphin defense now to take the ball back. It's interesting, McNair has to step up and make some plays for the Tennessee Oilers. He has more yards rushing today, Jim, than he does passing. That's right, he's 4-10 for 45 yards passing. He's 8 carries for 56 yards running the football. He's got to make some plays here in the passing game. Game is tied early in the fourth quarter. A lot of time left, 11-15 to go. 13-13. Footing can be difficult in this infield. Here's Eddie George, the straight line runner, as he likes to call himself. The big Buckeye from Ohio State, rushing out to the 25-yard line. The man who on opening day a week ago, as the Bills, uh, continually the Jets, had 216 yards at Eddie George. I think you're going to see more of the straight line running. They've got Hodgard, middle linebacker. Zach Thomas went as long as he could, coming back from the broken leg, but it's been difficult. McNair has missed his last six throws. He's going to have to make a play. You know, you can be too conservative. And they talk about being conservative. There's a point where you got to step up and make a big play as a quarterback. Second down and five. Back to the run. Dolphins do a good job making the chop on Eddie George. Terrell Buckley, a cornerback, came up and submarine the runner. And that brings up third down and about a yard. So they're very close. Really, they can power the ball and get the first down. And you always have to remember when you're dealing with Tennessee, you have Al Del Greco in there, a guy who had the NFL's longest field goal last season, 56 yards. And yeah, they'd love to, what they'd love to do right now is eat up a lot of clock time, go down the field. They'd love to get a touchdown, but if they could get a field goal, they'd feel pretty good, as long as they use up some clock. Hand off Eddie George, breaks a tackle, breaks another. And they talked about getting a lot of helmets on Eddie George. That time there's about seven guys throwing him back. But not until Eddie George rushes ahead for a first down. Corey Harris was the first to hit him, but when your free safety is the first guy to hit him, you're not doing well. Well, that was a good pickup. And Eddie George here, you see 69, number, number 69, the right tackle, John Runyon, pulling and making a key block there. 
But the interesting thing about uh, Eddie George there, he gets hit, but he's always going forward. He's always making positive yardage. That's a great shot. They talk about getting people to the football and gang tackling. That's a good example of it right there. But he was still tough to get down. Eddie George over 300 yards rushing for the season. 216 last week. He's got 85 today. The yards have come much tougher for Eddie George against the Dolphin defense. There is McNair letting the ball go long. He has a man open. A perfect throw. And they rule it's incomplete as he lost the ball on the way down. It did not touch the ground. It did not free it. As McNair makes his first deep throw of the day, an absolute thing of beauty. But Sanders can't hold on. Well, Sanders is their, is their best deep threat. It, it, Les Steckel told me, Les Steckel, the offensive coordinator, told me that Chris Sanders is one of the best receivers he's ever been around at catching the deep ball. He says he does a great job of adjusting and make the circus catch, but he didn't make it there. I think Calvin Jackson, 38, Jim, stripped him of the ball on the way down. Probably did. Looks like he did. Yep, right there. Oh, yes, he did. That was a nice job by Calvin Jackson. He did get it out of there. That was now, a good throw by McNair, though. McNair looked at the defense on second and ten, and he calls a timeout. And he talked yesterday how they wanted to stay away from having to adjust plays and burn timeouts, but they have to use In South Florida, and a perfect floor today. Temperature in the 80s. Clear and sunny. Game tied. 13 all is on second down and ten from the infield. Steve McNair looks over the Miami defense. Drops the throw. Big rush. Dumps it off, gets his man, and running for the first down is wide receiver Willie Davis. So McNair doing a masterful job there of eluding the rush and then deftly putting a soft touch on the ball and leading it to number, Davis for a 16-yard game. Number 95, Tim Ballins does a nice job on a pass rush right there, but Kevin Donnelly knocks him by the quarterback. McNair gets the ball off, and Willie Davis does a good job of picking up the first down. Excellent job, and a very nice throw by McNair there, Jim. Yeah, he needs to start doing that. I mean, he has to it. In. Yeah, he's got to do it. He, 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 he's got to make some plays here in this fourth quarter. Now he is five of 11 passes, 61 yards. Here's another throw and catch, short one, but the ball is advanced into the Miami side of the field, down to the 48-yard line. Anthony Harris makes the tackle on the H-back. Frank Wycheck, who's been quiet all game long, as he was against the Raiders last week, Number 89, Frank Wycheck, but then when they had to have him in the overtime, he made two big catches to set up the winning field goal. Right, and that last drive uh, before Del Greco kicked that, that field goal, uh, McNair had two good passes to Wycheck. He made two good catches and uh, very, very important in that drive. They could be looking at him again. He figures very prominently in their pass offense, Wycheck, although with just one catch today. Now we have a misfire. Looks like Stepnowski and McNair were not in sync. McNair was starting his drop, and McNowski, Stepnowski had not delivered the ball to him. Yeah, I don't you know. You know, no one is. Prior to the snap, ball start, number nine, five-yard penalty, repeat second down. In that kind of a situation, you don't know who's at fault there, whether McNair pulled out earlier, whether Stepnowski uh, snapped the ball late. It's hard to tell right now. I, I would guess that uh, that McNair pulled out a little bit early because none of the other offensive linemen were moving. If Stepnowski was late, the other offensive linemen would have been moving when uh, McNair pulled out. But at any rate, it sets them back now. Instead of second down and uh, two, it's going to be second down and about uh, long, almost eight. McNair goes to the draw play. Ronnie Harmon runs. Good defense by the Dolphins. As big Tim Bowens knocks him down. That's a real good play by number 95, Tim Bowens, the defensive left tackle. He read the draw perfectly, shed the blocker, made the play. He gets excited about it, too. And here's one of the big plays of this game, and there's been many with 7.15 to play, and the game tied. Third down and 10. Will the Dolphins be blitzing? They're not showing blitz. Looking to come with a four-man rush. That's what they come with. Here's McNair stepping up. And McNair is taken down on a sack by Gerald Gardner at the 46-yard line. So Reggie Roby, the Tennessee putter, comes out. 
A covered sack, maybe, Jimmy. He had nowhere to go. Yeah, the Dolphins had good coverage there, but you know, these, these defensive tackles, both Ballins and uh, Daryl Gardner, have had a good series here. Getting pressure on the quarterback, making the sack here by Gardner, number 92 right there. Uh, Ballins made the stop on the draw play the play before. These guys are, these guys are uh, stepping up to the plate right here and making some plays when it counts. Those were the two players that the Oiler offensive coach were most concerned about. The big tackles, a good punt by Roby, end over end, coming up on the ball. is Jordan who catches it, a dangerous catch by Jordan, and he's quickly taken down at the 21-yard line. A 34-yard punt and a one-yard return. The Dolphins will have it when we come back. We're back. Don Crickey with Jim Moore, and for a second time, the officials have said that Miami's punt returner signaled a fair catch, although it was a mysterious signal because we never saw it with cameras close on him. Here he is, and they assessed a major penalty against Houston, or against Tennessee. Now, he, there was the wave earlier. He waved earlier, and this is where it's ruled unnecessary roughness. But did Anthony Dorsett see that signal? He must not have because he waved early real quick. And, and he's waving in front of his chest. He does not have his hand extended high. you got to have the hand over your head. Well, I know it worked twice for Jimmy Johnson's team. And it gives the Dolphins the ball at their 36-yard line. A major development in the Dolphins' favor in this tie game. 13-all. And Marino, with his next completion, will go over 300 yards. And there it is. Holding the sideline is Troy Drayton. He's ahead for close to a first down. Now to Greg in New York. All right, Don, at the Meadowlands, Jets rookie wide receiver John Hall. He kicked a 55-yard field goal at Seattle a week ago. This one teed up from 52 yards out. He splits the uprights with room to spare. The Jets grab a 22-21 lead on Buffalo, but the Bills are back threatening inside the Jets' 10 in the fourth quarter, Don. Thank you, Greg. So the Bills coming alive after they were blown out at home. Yeah, they needed to come back and play a good game today against the Jets. Miami's, uh, Marino's doing a lot of audibleizing down there. Dropping to throw. Dan Marino stands in. Let's a long ball go. He's got a man going for it. Coverage is good. And the ball is incomplete. Wow. It looked like it was taken in. Giles Jordan caught the ball, but it's ruled by the official who's right on top of the play that his feet weren't in when he came down. Official did a good job there. He, Excellent. like you said, he was right there and uh, had a good clear shot. The good throw by Marino. And Jordan makes a nice catch, right? There, he gets his right, uh, that right foot was right on the line, the, and the left foot was clearly on the line. That was a good call. Look at the official's position. Perfect. Three feet away looking down at it. Yeah, Jerry Seaman would uh, have been proud of that. Jerry Seaman is the uh, director of officials for the National Football League, does a great job with his guys, and uh, uh, I I'm sure he he'll be thrilled with the, the position of the official on that call. And just like the players, as you know, Jim, every official is graded on every call in this league. Yeah, and, and it's and it's critical because the, the, if they if they do a good job, then they get playoff games. You know, they're awarded playoff games depending upon how they perform during the regular season. And now while we have a moment, let's take a look at the Miller Light game summary. Dan Reno has figured prominently in it in this 13-13 game. Marino with 295 yards passing, Eddie George with 85 yards rushing, including the 13-yard touchdown run. And the Dolphins in the red zone with two field goals and a touchdown. But twice they went on fourth down and failed to convert. Houston took over, the Tennessee Oilers took over the ball with five minutes and 40 seconds left to play in the game. Miami led first, 3-0. It was 10-3 at halftime, Tennessee. And now it is locked up at 13-all. Reno and the Dolphins break the huddle with first third down arising at their 40-yard line. What do you look for, Jim? Well, they got to throw the football right here, and uh, they might try to hit that little slant pattern again. Marino's going to look over the defense. He's going to see, you know, kind of try to figure out what they're going to do, and then he's going to audibleize, which he's doing. He's making the call right now. He's checking them out. Marino out of the shotgun, stands in, throws hard, and the ball is caught and lost as the defender was right there to hit him. Charles Jordan had the ball on his hands, but... Daryl Lewis, who's been a Pro Bowl cornerback, he made the pop and freeze the ball, and the Dolphins failed to convert on third down. So now it goes back to Houston's end as Kyle Richardson, the new punter for Miami, is in to kick. 
Yeah, yeah, a lot of drops. You know, they, they, they rec uh, Marino's receivers have had some drops today, as, as have the Oilers receivers. But what Marino was trying to do right there was just pick up the first down. He had Jordan go down and run a hook past the uh, the, the down marker, and uh, but uh, Lewis made a good play on the ball. And here is Richardson, a long punt. Jack pedaling and taking the ball is Nell Gray. He's to the 15 and to the 20, and he's out to the 22-yard line. And with 5.20 to play in the game, the ball changes hands. A 51-yard punt by the new punter. An 11-yard return. And here is the new Third Rock game plan. Third Rock's jumping to Wednesday starting September 17th at 9, 8 Central. They're going long for the big play and score. Third Rock on the move Wednesdays this fall. Ball now positioned uh, just across the 20-yard line at the 21. So again, the onus on McNair to get the ball downfield. Hands off. Middle of the Dolphin defense takes on Eddie George as he gets ahead for a gain of five yards to the 31-yard line. Looks like they're staying with that running game, Don, with George. You know, one of the things that uh, Miami felt like they had to do defensively was not give up the big play. And they've done a good job at that today. One of the things that makes George so good is coaches all talk about how in 95-degree heat with high humidity after the two-a-day practices, he would do extra wind sprints after each one. All the Oilers were doing extra wind sprints today because they knew they'd be uh, in an all-out battle in what could be very humid conditions. It's not that humid, not as much as it can be in South Florida, but it is very warm in the 80s. Hand off to Eddie George, and here's the penalty marker. There's going to be a holding call on the Houston Oilers. They got Zach Thomas back in there, middle linebacker now. So that sets the Oilers way back, and very likely... Holding. Holding, number 77, offense, 10-yard penalty, remain second down. We talked about running those extra sprints during the week for, by George. Jeff Fisher told us that on Thursday, the whole team was going to run extra sprints, and he was concerned about them being too tired, you know, and, and, and not being fresh for the game. So he had to tell them, hey, guys, don't do it today. Les Steckel, the offensive coordinator, told us that the offensive team all ran extra sprints after practice on Wednesday. Holding call was on Kevin Donnelly, who's been one of the best guards. He said last week, we got Eddie George 100 yards. He got 116 by himself. That was against the Raiders, and now Eddie George looks to break it, and Eddie George on a long yardage play. Second down and 14 is ahead for a gain of about 11 yards. When we talked to Eddie George yesterday, he, uh, he, 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 he said that last year, every week that he got 100 yards, he'd take the offensive line out to dinner, and that this year, he's going to take him, out, take him out to dinner regardless of whether he gets 100 yards or not. The other thing he did last year for the offensive line was he, all, he bought him all Rolex watches at the end of the season. And somebody suggested to him yesterday, well, maybe if you have another big year, get him all cars. And he said, well, that's something to think about. Buffalo and the Jets coming down to the wire as we go back to Greg Gumbel in New York. Greg? All right, Don, and at the Meadowlands, former teammates at Michigan, Todd Collins and Jay Reamers in the hookup here. This is a 10-yard touchdown pass, and with the extra point, the Bills have the lead on the New York Jets now. It's 28-22. to They're in the fourth quarter, just under six and a half minutes to play, Don. Looks like they might not be done, though, with six and a half to go. Yeah, there, there's been some pretty good scoring back and forth in that game. You know, you talked earlier, Don, about, hey, you, the second game, how important it is. It's an extremely important game for the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills lost, week to the, lost last week to the Vikings. You know, they didn't want to go 0-2. They're playing a division game against the Jets today. It was important for them to win this game, especially on the road in New York. You know, you talk about road wins. That doesn't matter who it's against. Every win on the road in this league is huge. It's so hard to win on the road. Now, this would be absolutely enormous for Tennessee if they could come away from Miami with a win. Yes, it will. Yeah. Here's the uh, upcoming schedule for the Dolphins. It gets tougher for them after they open the first two games at home at Green Bay, at Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay looks to be maybe the most improved team in the NFL this year. And they come back after a bye week to play Kansas City. 
Yep. The, the Dolphins with a leg up having two home games to start the season. Yeah, that Green Bay game next week will be televised by NBC. It's a big game. Uh, the Dolphins going up there on the road playing the Super Bowl champion. Here's third down and a long four. Ronnie Harmon is in the backfield for Tennessee. McNair gets some time. Now he runs out of it. McNair takes off. He didn't get there. And the Oilers have to punt the ball back to the Dolphins as Trace Armstrong, the veteran defensive lineman from Florida, former number one draft choice of the Chicago Bears, makes the tackle. You know, Trace Armstrong was a guy that the uh, Oiler coaches felt they had to really account for. And he's been a little quiet today. You haven't heard his name mentioned very often, but he does a good job here of reacting back to McNair when he starts to scramble up the middle. And as this game wears on, more and more, you get the feeling we are going to overtime. Three minutes and 15 seconds left to play. Still time for the Dolphins to get in field goal range. A booming punt by the ex-Dolphin, Roby. Downfield it goes. Here's Charles Jordan and a good return. Jordan breaks it. Yes, Roby is left. And Roby finally gets him out of bounds, but does it at the 42-yard line. So now Marino and the Dolphins not that far from getting in field goal range on a 52-yard punt and then a 42-yard return. Well, the, the, the Dolphins spent a lot of time in the kicking game. Jimmy Johnson realizes the importance of the kicking game. It's going to pay off from here. It's a nice bit of running by Jordan. That's good job. Reggie Roby kept him from going the distance, but as it is, the Dolphins now will go on offense first down and 10 at the 42-yard line. And there is Orlando Mate. Orlando Mate might be the hero again this week. He hit three for three last week. Missed his first today. He subsequently hit. Game is tied. 13-13 three, three, as the handoff goes. And Irving spikes as Jimmy Johnson is saying, we're going big back. Three mad duel Jabbar couldn't get it done against this quick, tough oiler defense. Marcus Robertson makes the stop for the Oilers. You know, Don Jabbar uh, sprained his ankle last week against Indianapolis, and he was a little bit questionable this week to play the game. He did start, but uh, it's probably bothering him a little bit now, and they got spikes in there. Critical time of the game right here. They need the guy that's 100% healthy. Yeah, in fairness to Jabbar, and there he is on the field, a lot of people thought he wasn't going to be ready this week. He had some kind of herbal wrap, his own uh, treatment of his sprained ankle, and... He's back in the lineup. Second down comes up, and they hand off to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who is knocked down at about the 36-yard line. Third down and four arises for the Miami Dolphins. As we wind down now to the two-minute warning, the NFL on NBC continues with the Dolphins close to what might be winning field goal range. This is Don Crickey back at Miami, where the Dolphins now have third down coming up. And they need four. Big backs in the backfield. Marino's found a lot of stuff open to throw the ball, Jim, on underneath pattern. Yeah, I think he's going to throw the ball here. I think they feel that they have a best, better chance to pick it up here throwing a football. Oilers looking like they're going to blitz. They are. Here comes the blitz. There's the throw. Incomplete as uh, somebody heard footsteps. Charles Jordan. He was looking at the defense and Darrell Lewis more than he was looking at the ball. And there's another drop. Uh, Charles Jordan. By a Mi Miami receiver. Here's Jordan. He's got good coverage by Darrell Lewis right there. Uh, he was concerned about that. He was concerned about one of those safeties coming over there and popping him. Marino isn't very happy about that. That wasn't a great throw in that kind of a route. You know, you could get it more into the, the, the midsection of the guy. You don't want him to have to reach out like that. You want it right in there in the gut. But uh, he still should have had it. Now we're a minute and 56 from overtime as Kyle Richardson gets set to punt for Miami. Miami taking a delay a game. They don't mind getting set back five yards, give their punter more room to work, although the, uh, the Oilers are free to wave off the penalty. Oh, that's very frustrating. That's a very frustrating situation for Dan Marino, you know, and those... One thing I thought that they might have... that Jimmy Johnson might have figured right there is that they were in four-down territory. You know, maybe run the ball on third down, get it close to the first down marker, then go for it on fourth down like he did earlier in the half. Marino obviously not happy on the sideline. Here's the new acquisition, Kyle Richardson, as he boots the ball into and out of the end zone. 
And he attempted a placement punt, went for naught. That wasn't a good punt. You know, you'd like to at least attempt to get it up there high and, and get it inside the 10. Jimmy Johnson takes his Miami Dolphins to Green Bay to play the world champion Packers. And you can see it here on many of these NBC stations, starting with the NFL on NBC at 12 noon next Sunday. Seattle heads into Indianapolis to play the Colts next Sunday also, as right now, the Houston Oilers, or the Tennessee Oilers, have the ball at their 20-yard line, and they have it 80 yards from the Miami Dolphin end zone. Tennessee has a guy that can hit from uh, 56 yards, but it should also be noted that the wind is not working with the Oilers here in the fourth quarter. It's going to be interesting to see if they really try to make an attempt to win this football game if they do right now, right now. If they do, McNair's got to make some plays in the passing game. Hands off to Eddie George, and he runs the ball out to the 27-yard line. And the game clock kicks down, so it looks like the Oilers are going to... They're not making much effective use of time here. They're just uh, huddling at their leisure, and the clock's winding down. Down to 1.30 to play, and the game is tied. Overtime is coming. And off Eddie George. They don't want to risk turning the ball over with a pass, apparently, Jim, with a young quarterback who's been somewhat shaky today. Yeah, he's been real shaky today. But again, you know, in, in a time like this, you've got to have confidence in your quarterback that he can make a play and that you give him an opportunity to win the football game. Well, it's, it's going to be difficult for them to do it if they just keep handing off to Eddie George right now with only a minute left. Exactly, because in, uh, now on third and short, he takes it himself for the first he's down, but there. they don't try to stop the clock. And in overtime, even if you win the toss, you're going to get a kickoff. Your quarterback's going to have to do something for you. Now we have a timeout signal for with 53 seconds left in the game, and it's tied. Now will the Oilers' Jim Mora show any confidence in their quarterback and give him the green light to throw the ball? It doesn't look to me like they're going to do that. They've, they've had three straight runs on this series, and we'll, we'll see what happens here. But it looks to me like they're content to go into overtime. 53 seconds left. Here is a good play fake. Just as we said it, there's a long ball. Man is open, and it's caught! Chris Sanders is open, and he gets the ball inside the 25-yard line. So they finally say to McNair, air it out, and Aaron McNair puts it on the money from 47 yards away, and the Oilers are in winning field goal range. Well, this is a, a play, you know, he fakes the run right there. They ran three times in a row in the last third. He fakes the run. And then he bootlegs it out and, and makes a nice throw to uh, to Sanders, who was coming across from there. Look at him coming down there. Now watch him go. A deep crossing route. A deep crossing route. Number 22 to the left of your screen, Sean Wooden, should have been back in that zone. But he bit on the run fake. He bit on the run fake, and he should have been back. Now it'll be Eddie George, then more Eddie George. The ball's to the 25-yard line, a loss of three yards. You add 17 from the line of scrimmage for the field goal distance. So this would be a 42-yarder from where the ball's now positioned. And the Oilers, at their leisure, uh, they're just letting the clock wind down. Apparently, they're confident that their man, Al Del Greco, the 14-year veteran from Auburn, Alabama. Yeah, they've got a lot of confidence in Del, Re Del Greco. Del Greco's been in this spot many, many times, and uh, all they got to do right now is let it go down right to the end and let Del Greco take a shot at it. Here's a guy that won it in overtime last week before he did. The Raiders called timeout to ice him, and they asked Del, Del Greco about that after the game. He said, that's exactly what I expected. I expect to have a timeout called, and that's how I prepare. Yeah, the Raiders did it twice, twice in a row. You know, and he said it didn't bother him a bit. He said he knew it was going to happen. He was ready for it. He's made like 53 of his last 59 field goals. Let's watch Del Greco a week ago, overtime at Memphis Liberty Bowl. Conley setting up to the ball in overtime. On the way, his not only go through, they go through the middle only. You could have a narrower goal post. The best golfer in the NFL is might well be the best place kicker. It might be both. You know, I asked him uh, when we were talking to him last week before the Raider game, I asked him what he wanted to do when he got done kicking. He said he wants to be a golf pro. Well, he could do that also. You know, those golfers that get into some tough situations, some pressure situations where they got to make the putt, they got to make the, the critical shot. Well, he's going to be used to it because he's been in a lot of pressure situations in his career as a kicker. They stop the clock with 11 seconds. The reason for that is 
if a uh, bad snap, they still get another chance. But he is kicking into a pretty good win. So this is more like a 50-yard field goal, even though it'll measure 43. It's on the way. Del Greco hits it up. And no good. Al Del Greco misses, and we're heading to overtime. Five seconds left. We've got a lot more football to play at Miami. Looked like a high snap. Yeah, it was a high snap, you know. So the normally automatic Al Del Greco kicking. Take a look at this. Number uh, 74, Bruce Matthews, is the snapper here. It was a high snap, and that messes up the kicker's timing. So much of that field goal kicking right there is timing. The ball is placed on the ground. The kicker starts at a certain time, comes through with the leg. The timing was uh, not quite what it should have been right there because of the high snap, and he was off target. It was long enough, but he was to the right. So the Dolphins will calmly down the ball, let the clock run out, go to the coin flip, and see who starts overtime with the ball. The wind could have been a factor also, Jim, as there is a gusting wind blowing into Al Del Greco's face in a 43-yard field goal attempt. So now, for the second straight week, you and I head to overtime with the Oilers. Yeah, this has a, a, a been a, a good baptism for me, Don, getting two overtime games in my first two games here. We're going to stay for the coin flip. Then we'll be back for overtime. As Del Greco, who has just been magnificent through last season in this, in his 14th year in the NFL, is wide right on a field goal attempt that could have won the game. So much, as I said earlier, you know, that... Here they come now. The tri-captains come out onto the field for the, uh, the flip of the coin. You were saying, Jim? Well, you know, I was going to say that so much of that field goal kicking is timing, and, and you know, they, they work on it all the time in practice. Here. Heads on one side, tails the other. Who will call it? 31 will call it in the air. Heads is called. Team called. Tails it is. Last week, visiting team with the Raiders, they called heads. It was tails, and the Tennessee Oilers had the ball to start, but now the home team Dolphins will have the ball to start overtime. So we'll be back with overtime at Miami after this. See where we're going to overtime. The game tied 13 all. Bruce Matthews, nine times an all-pro player, the long snapper for the Tennessee Oilers. He snap might have been a bit high here. Yeah, it was a little bit high and a little bit behind the holder there. And I, I think it just threw Del Greco's timing off. But like you said, too, there is a little bit of a wind blowing down there. Del Greco might have tried to, uh, to uh, adjust to that and uh, threw him off just a little bit. Well, apparently, Jim, Tennessee must think the wind is coming from the other way. The Miami players think it's because they lost the toss. Miami will receive, and Tennessee is kicking off the same direction that Del Greco just missed from. Yeah, that's surprising to me. I don't know why they're doing that, but they must have a reason. He kicks it down to the seven-yard line. Here comes Irving. Spikes! He's got an open channel. Spikes in open field. All the way down to the 45-yard line of Tennessee. 48-yard return as a major special team play by the Dolphins sets them in excellent position to possibly win the game. The Dolphins really work hard in the kicking game. Now, every team works hard. A lot of teams talk about working hard, but the Dolphins really work at it. And, 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 and Jimmy Johnson realizes the importance of it, realizes how what kind of field position it's going to bring in. And right here, they get back to the, 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 the Oiler 45-yard line. Well, what a way to start off overtime. That offense goes in with a lot of confidence right now. That whole offensive game plan changes when they start out the drive at this position right here. And Marino will start overtime with the shotgun offense. Here's an all-out blitz against him. He throws. And uh, turning out of the ball, it's dropped by Fred Barnett. Was not a great throw. I mean, it's, well, you can call the receivers all he wanted. That was not a great throw. Not, wasn't a gra that was not a great throw by Marino. Uh, not close to one. The Oilers, the Oilers had the blitz on, and uh, he was saw it coming and hurried a little bit. Nah, that was Poor a tough throw. Yeah, that was not a good throw. It was on Marino. So the ball to the 45-yard line, second down and 10. You've got to blame him once in a while, right? Yeah, well, he's, <laughs> he's had a lot of good ones, but he's had some off the mark. And again, he steps in the shotgun. They've been coming with a blitz. Now they look to be backing off the blitz. Marino stands in. He takes a look. Dumps it over the middle, a beautifully executed play. And hits the ball is Bernie Parmelee. He's down to the 29-yard line. 
And Marino has his first 300-yard passing game in the Jimmy Johnson era. 16-yard game. Well, this is a big play here. Now, they blitzed on the first down and the second down here. They didn't blitz. They're all playing the zone. They left the zone open right there. They left the zone open. They got the ball out there to Parmalee. The mention again, the Dolphins all talking about it's difficult to kick on the infield. Mud infield is not good footing, and they have a rookie kicker. He's hit two today, has missed one from the infield. Here's a handoff, and the ball is taken nowhere by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He has dropped at the 33-yard line. There is Orlando Mare. Yeah, Mare, Mare uh, had, a, had a great game last week. He kicked three, go three field goals, as you mentioned, Don, and, and went in when, uh, when Kidd got hurt, pulled a hamstring, and had to kick five punts, averaged over uh, 47 yards on the punting... Uh, Monty grew up about 10 miles from the Dolphin Complex here in Miami. He went to Syracuse, uh, kicked for Syracuse. He and his dad used to practice on the local fields around here. They take two footballs and a kicking tee out there and practice on their own. Here's Marino making the throw and the connection down to the 24-yard line. As Fred Barnett comes off the flank. And the veteran Fred Barnett has the Dolphins in good field goal range. And now a personal foul call we might have. And a critical error by the Tennessee Oilers, if that is the case. Well, you know, it's really important that you keep your poise in these kind of situations. Oh, that's the game. What a stupid play, costing his team quite possibly the game. Half the distance to the goal. Tom Moore Barnes. This was one of the problems Jeff Fisher told us about why he got rid of Barnes in training camp this year. He said he did some, some things that weren't too smart. Now, watch him. Watch him, he's gonna, he's gonna stand up and kick him right there. Oh man, you can't do that. You've gotta keep your poise, you gotta keep your cool. Prediction, Tamor Barnes has played his last game as a Tennessee Oiler. Okay. Very, very possible. So now it is all set for the Dolphins to win the game and they're not gonna wait. They're sending Lindo Mare out. Tamor Barnes, it's not your day. And we'll see you as Lindo Mares with the game tied 13 all in overtime. A personal foul against Tom Urban moves the ball down to the 11-yard line. So it'll be about a 28 or 29-yard field goal. Each team gets two timeouts in overtime, and uh, I think uh, the Oilers here are going to use it to try to have... All right, think it over a bit here, Jim. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna use the, the timeout. Amade's a, a rookie. You know, it's only the second game he's ever kicked in the NFL. And and another thing here, Don, is he's kicking off the infield, the dirt infield. And he told us yesterday, he says when you that you asked him, he said, what's the difference in kicking off the grass in the infield? He says, when you kick off the infield, the foot that you're planting, not the foot you're kicking with, but your plant foot, you don't get good traction and it slips a little bit. And he says a lot of times you end up kicking dirt. Mari Tad's in the hospital, had uh, some problems with surgery, but he's coming along well. Linda was with him uh, last night, and his dad's been his coach. And this would be a great moment, as he always dreamed of playing for the Miami Dolphins growing up in South Florida. He went to a Syracuse University, recruited as a punter. And as you talked about, Jimmy, had a great day kicking last week, both field goals and punting when John Kidd got hurt. Today he's just been a field goal kicker, missed his first from 26 yards, almost an identical spot from where they are now. Yes, he did. Then he made two more, and that's helped tie the game 13 all. You know, it's interesting, as you mentioned his dad, Don. Don his dad went and, and saw all of his games when he was in Syracuse. Now, his family lives here in Florida, in Miami. His dad saw all his games in Syracuse, and, and he, they played two home games. They played last week and then here, and he, he missed both of those. He had gallbladder surgery on Thursday prior to the Colt game a week ago, or a week and a half ago. He missed that game, went back in the hospital this week, had some complications and he's missing this game too. Hasn't been able to see either one, but I'm sure he's listening to it on the radio. Wow, what a moment for Jimmy Johnson's his, and his uh, Dolphins. They battled back. They were up 3-0, and then they were down 10-3, and then they were down 13-10, and now they've tied it up at 13-all. They're down 13-7 and tied it up 13-all. And now they have Mare. The hole will be at about the 30. 30-yard field goal attempt to hold it about the 20. Snap and set down, and the Oilers say, uh, let's let this young guy think it over some more. So, we have another timeout. We'll be back in a moment. 
Back at Miami, and memories are made of this. For Lindo Mare, first-year player from Syracuse, he was on the taxi squad of the New York Giants last year. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson, his name is A. He actually wants to pronounce Mare. He said when he first came here, he didn't really care how he pronounced it. He was so happy to be here. He said, but when guys start to make a few kicks, then they really want to pronounce the right way, and you can't blame them. Yeah, you, 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 you become a little bit more familiar with these rookies when you see them starting to produce for you. The veterans start to learn their names and a little bit more about them. One of the things, though, you know, that uh, in talking to the, some of the Dolphin players yesterday, they don't haze their rookies. Well, once that rookie becomes a, a member of that football team, they don't haze him. Come to camp, and, you know, they don't shave their heads. They don't tie him to a fence post. They don't, they don't uh, make him <laughs> sing at the training table because they say, hey, you're a Dolphin now. Now we're going to treat you like a Dolphin. You're not a rookie. We're all in this together. Kenny Holmes, the rookie number one pick for the Tennessee Oilers, told us they've been trying all camp, trying to tape him to the goalpost so they can't catch him. Now, what could be the game-ending kick in overtime? Marte puts it up, and he is down the middle, and he is good. And Lindo Marte, the local boy, makes good with a game-winning field goal as he grabs the ball. And the uh, Oilers with a heartbreaking loss, but a terrific comeback win for Dan Marino and the Dolphins as they go to 2-0, heading into Green Bay next week. Yeah, it's a great, great game. Well, watch the replay here, Jim. Yeah, take a look at the field goal. Pretty, uh, looked like a little, you know, it was a good snap. Good snap right there, and uh, good technique by Lindo, and put it right down the middle. So you remember the Oilers had a chance with a long field goal at the conclusion of regulation, but it was wide. And then the play got downfield, then the personal foul call against uh, Tamur Barnes of the Tennessee Oilers. Moved the ball half the distance to the goal. And the Dolphins never elected to even try another play from scrimmage. They set right up for the field goal, and the Rook wins it. 16-13. Mare, Dolphins 16, Tennessee Oilers 13. Coming up next, it's the Sun America NFL and NBC postgame report with Greg Gumbel. Now for Jim Mora. This is Don Cricky saying so long from Miami. The NFL and NBC is a presentation of NBC Sports, the network of the Super Bowl.